Okay, seeing in presence of quorum, uh, call meeting of the Amherst School Committee to order at uh, 6.01 p.m. Welcome, everyone. And just as a note, uh, this meeting is being recorded but not live broadcast uh, by Amherst Media. So welcome, everyone. Um, this is a uh, slightly different meeting of Amherst School Committee. Um, this is a meeting that was actually added um, by the, the committee last uh, December, actually, in December 2018, so that we could have this discussion around the MSBA uh, Statement of Interest application. And so um, a little bit of an unusual format uh, in a few different ways. So I thought I would take a moment to explain how that's going to be a little different today and then, um, and then turn it over to Dr. Morris, if that's OK. Yeah, that'd be great. OK. Um, so one of the things that we're doing a little differently, as one of our committee members pointed out, is that we don't have minutes to approve tonight, which is our usual format. Um, but really what we wanted to do tonight was have a conversation um, around the MSBA application process uh, and to talk a little bit about the history involved in our pursuit of applying for state uh, funding for our elementary school buildings. Um, at our last meeting in December, we had uh, discussed the recent uh, rejection of our applications for both Fort River and Wildwood. And um, this is something that we recognize is of great interest to the community. Um, we have gotten a lot of emails and a lot of uh, outreach from community members. I think every single one of us probably on the committee, uh, both as a committee and individually, have been reached out to by many folks, which is great. We love seeing that kind of engagement uh, and enthusiasm, but of course, this is a very serious topic. So we also wanted to make sure that we were doing our due diligence um, and taking time to explain a little bit about the history of this application to the state um, and try to provide some more information for the community about the format and process moving forward. Um, one of the things that I just wanted to say before we dive in is that uh, we all recognize the urgency of this situation. Uh, there's been a lot of documented information about the state of our school buildings, and I think this committee has shown incredible interest in treating this matter very seriously and urgently. So that is what we're hoping we can do with the superintendent's guidance tonight. Um, the other thing I wanted to say is we're missing a committee member tonight, uh, Ms. Carrie Spitzer actually wasn't able to attend tonight because of a family emergency. I hear things have are gotten better anyway, um, but she really wanted to be here tonight, and I have some words from her that I'll be sharing a little bit later today. So with that, Dr. Morris, I'm just going to turn it over to you. Sure. Um, I think I was going to make one unrelated. There's no superintendent update, but just one unrelated <coughs> update, uh, which is a good news update. Um, cautious not on the agenda, so I'll just say it and we'll move on, but uh, is that our dual language program, as you may remember, had... Um, after your vote, but there was an application process to DESE, and it was um, successfully responded to. So we, we DESE had not just approved it, but also with some very positive commentary on the work of staff who put together the application and all the work that's going into uh, planning and developing that program. So, that's great news. Yeah, Thank so you. I thought I'd share that because it, it seemed timely, if unrelated. Um, but um, yeah, and so this slide deck, as school committee members know, got done late this afternoon, so it'll be on the website tomorrow morning for people who are interested, um, just trying to pull together lots of information very quickly and um, took a little while longer. So this is always still a little funny with the cutoff, as Mr. Denley notes. This screen is the better one to look at um, if you want to follow along, because you can only make about three quarters of the length, the words show up on that one back there, which I apologize. I think I may actually just turn it off because it's just not helpful um, and probably distracting for the lights to be behind you. That's okay because it just, you really can't make sense of okay. what's behind you. So that one works better. Um, Can everyone see the, that screen okay? Yeah. yeah, I apologize, but okay. this one's still askew a bit. Um, okay. So thanks for uh, planning this kind of, I won't call it special meeting because that's a different purpose, but I think it's a special meeting. It's, you know, off schedule, but I think responding to information that we received from MSPA and to the chair's point, um, I know how much contact I've had with individual school committee members, just, you know, are we going to talk about it and making sure we get this on the agenda and bring it to the public forefront um, as soon as possible. So this, given the, I think we talked about it, I think it was the December meeting, and, you know, with the break coming in, it just didn't allow for uh, a meeting at that time period, but this is as soon as we were able to pull it together. So I want to start from a place I know um, 
a lot of people have been following this process for a long time, and then some people um, are new to this process or just uh, working on this. So I want to start from a place of talking about some of the concerns that we have about the school buildings. And I know uh, some people have seen me or others talk about this before, but I just want to um, start from that place to build a common understanding, at least from my perspective, of where we are and where we hope to go. Um, so three primary concern areas that we've had about Wildwood and Fort Rivers infrastructure. Again, they are wonderful schools with wonderful staff and wonderful students, and uh, that's in spite of, not because of, the building that those, um, <coughs> those students and staff and faculty are in. So the first is just a general building condition. So one frame of reference is the MSBA uh, assumes that buildings can, can be functional school buildings for 50 years. Uh, so when you build, that's one of the that, uh, ingredients that's in the cake of any MSBA process is an assumption that 50 years is a typical lifespan of a building until significant renovations are needed. Uh, and I know for some people that feels short. Many people's homes in this community are are um, older than 50 years, but the, the work, um, I'll just pick Wildwood. So, you know, there's 410 students roughly, um, upwards of 70, 80 staff members who are in that building putting a lot of pounding on it, 180 days a year plus the work that happens in the summer. They're <coughs> eating in a large caf in cafeteria spaces. And so schools, the wear and tear on schools is, is a little more significant than it is on residential homes. And I think that's why MSBA, even in 2019, has that 50 year assumption. Uh, Wildwood's 50 year anniversary is coming up next year, 2020, Fort Rivers three years after. So just all the building systems, the life of the buildings, um, they're getting towards the end of their useful life or the planned life of the schools. Um, and while some building, both buildings have had minor renovations from time to time, ripping up carpet, which was significant for the health of the buildings, but not significant in terms of addressing some of those core systems. Um, that's a while. So we've replaced boilers. We've done some things over the last five, six years that have assisted in that, but we still have a lot of original systems, original furniture, uh, furnishings uh, in the schools, and they're just, everything's getting to that place in terms of wear and tear where we need, we're going to need to do something uh, about the buildings. The second is the safety. Um, buildings were built very differently in 1970 than they are now, and that's true in a whole host of ways, but school safety is certainly a larger issue now in the design of buildings uh, than it was then. We could never build those buildings today, just purely from a safety perspective. Having the office about 100 feet away from the front entrance, uh, having the, the doors, the exterior doors, the weight and, and size that they are, they would never, the MSBA wouldn't fund. Uh, if, you, if an architect put a design out where the front entrance was 100 feet away, MSBA would say, no, you know, what are you talking about? What are you doing here? They would never accept that. Um, so we do have those ongoing safety concerns for buildings. We mitigate them as best we can with the video system so that office staff can see visitors as they come into the building, but it doesn't really sacrifice, it doesn't substitute for uh, a design that would prioritize school safety. Um, it's, it's not really, it's the best we can do, but uh, for me it's not sufficient. And the last is the educational challenges. So I think it's been talked about a lot, but the open classrooms impinge on our ability to provide a high quality education. Uh, and there's many accessibility issues, both physical but also from a learning perspective. And the hard thing is they, they impact the most vulnerable, vulnerable students the most. So students who are, uh, for instance, English language learners, um, there's research that they're more, more distracted by hearing multiple classrooms at once, which happens in an open classroom design. Um, and I could go on and on on that, so I'm trying to do a broad summary now. Uh, but, you know, building conditions of safety and the educational challenges, those are the three kind of large categories of concerns that, that I have. And I think since it's a short slide deck, I'm looking at the chair, should I just look up after every slide, see if there's questions, but plan to roll through? Does that work for the committee? I mean, the, the idea was really to have this be a presentation, you know, with discussion, and then we'll allow for public comment and then have uh, further conversation afterwards. But that works for everyone? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So in terms of specific areas of concern, just to be a little more narrow, and, and uh, I want to be cautious. Ooh, Sorry. thank you. <laughs> this is behind me. I'm never going to remember until Eric reminds me. Um, <coughs> this is not an exhaustive list. So these are the primary ones. I see staff members in the audience. I think I'm sure they could uh, certainly add to the list. Uh, but these are the ones that, from my perspective, are the most um, significant or prevalent. It's not intended to say that every issue that the buildings have is on, is on this list. So the open classroom design, for those of you who are unfamiliar with it, uh, and I know the committee are, but just I think it's worth stating, is that we have um, the, the walls uh, are not, don't provide acoustic privacy, which is a fancy way of saying they don't keep the noise out. 
from one classroom to another, uh, from most of the classrooms in the building, all except the kindergarten and some of the small group rooms. And so uh, even as an adult, there are times where I'm challenged when I'm you know, in a classroom because I'm aware of the noise that's behind me. Having taught in these classrooms, it's certainly a distraction for both students um, and staff alike. The second is ADA compliance. We'll be talking about that more at the next meeting and having an update from a consultant who did an ADA, um, <coughs> which is an American with Disabilities Act, um, Act uh, compliance review. So uh, what is the accessibility for students um, on the outside of the building as well as the inside of the building? From safety, I talked about the distance from the entry to the office space, but also the external doors. So we are in the process of replacing the external doors at those schools, but they're incredibly heavy. In an emergency, there's a question of whether staff and students uh, in an emergency could open them themselves. Um, so it's really a critical safety issue. Univents, which are the systems by which warm and cool air enter the classrooms. Um, it's an incredibly outdated system. And so even though we have new boilers at Wildwood, which are working great and are improving the condition uh, and the experience of staff, the fact that they have to go through an extremely outdated univent system reduces you know, the efficiency and how much actual warm air comes out. Uh, and, the, and the lived experience of staff and students in the buildings. Um, it's also the case that the company that created them, these are original to the building, um, so getting parts when things break down, it, it's all those uh, co challenges complicate uh, when things go wrong, how quickly we can respond and fix them. So we have a natural, lack of natural light in many classrooms at those schools. Again, that's because of that quad open classroom design, a lot of evidence and research that uh, all of us, not just children, but actually everybody, works better in environments where natural light comes in and um, basically half the classrooms at each site receive little to no natural light um, coming in. Uh, you know, it, it, this one's a hard one to explain, but I think it's worth noting that there's small classroom spaces. If you look on a map, like a floor map, the classroom spaces don't look small, but because of the quad system, a significant amount of real estate in each classroom has to be used for students to get to the bathroom or to, if you're in the back quad for the students, if you're in the front quad, for students in the back quad to be able to walk through your room to get to their room. So the, the functional space, and we found this out in the Fort River feasibility, is quite small, well below MSBA state standards for classroom spaces. Uh, and it's again that balance of trying to make it as accessible as possible then shrinks the usable classroom space of the room. So um, it's a balance that we'd rather not have uh, on both ends of that. Our electrical panels are um, original to the building. They're made by a company that's longer in um, in business um, that had a uh, not great history of uh, electrical panels. We have a plan for that in our capital plan to have them certified and reviewed, um, but it is a major concern from a safety perspective. It's also when we want to add things to the building, like one-to-one -one computers in grade three to six, how much electrical pull um, do we have in making sure that's safe? It's just an additional layer of challenge. So we have high cost and inefficient energy use uh, for a community that voted a net or town meeting, a community who, whose town meeting voted a net zero bylaw. These are far, far from being green schools. Um, I think I'll leave it there, but there's a cost to the environment, there's a cost to the taxpayers as well. So both roofs are uh, getting to their end of their useful life. Uh, Fort Rivers had more significant <coughs> issues uh, with um, water coming in, but both buildings, uh, roofs are at the end of their useful life. Uh, the cooling systems, we had a cooling system breakdown at Wildwood this fall, which you all heard quite a bit about, rightfully so, from uh, staff, families, and students who were um, having a very difficult time with how hot it was. Um, it was hot outside, but it was uh, incredibly hot inside, and those systems, um, actually at all three elementary schools, candidly, need significant updating. Um, this isn't about air conditioning, this is actually just getting functional cool air coming into the room, uh, coming into the schools. Um, we're far from having air conditioning in a wild river fort river but even beyond that just having cool air come in was not uh, not functioning well and the building envelope which talks about windows how air gets in and out of the school you know we're talking about original windows that don't have multiple panes the way you would build it in 2019 um, so on cold days even if the warm air is blowing you get kind of the breeze uh, that comes through those and uh, there's other areas of the building envelope that would be, need to be tightened, both for an energy efficiency standpoint, but also for a comfort standpoint as well. So again, not an exhaustive list, but you know, some of the primary concerns. So um, <coughs> this is you know, perhaps outdated, except we haven't done a tremendous amount in the last five years of the building, so I think it's still a relevant slide. So this was a statewide survey that was done. Uh, all, 
all teachers across the Commonwealth were given the opportunity. And you can see that the prompt was a number of teachers who agree with the, the statement that the physical environment of the classrooms in the school supports teaching and learning. So across Massachusetts, 83% uh, of teachers agreed with that. At Wildwood School, it was 24%. At Fort River School, it was 9%. And at Crocker Farm, it was 93%. So you can see the distinct differences in what teachers were telling us uh, between our three schools, but also compared to the state average. So we've been talking quite a bit, and we'll talk more at our next meeting about short-term capital planning. Um, just to be clear, when I say short-term capital planning, I'm referring not to a building project. There's ongoing capital work that can improve the condition of the schools. And some of the concerns on the prior page can be addressed with significant capital planning if the, fund, if the town so funds us. To do that, one is roofs. You know, each one is, you know, you would estimate over $2 million at this point. Uh, the last estimate was 1.9, but that's escalated up. You'd be over $2 million, uh, which is a lot of money for roofs. Um, I'm not saying it's not needed, but uh, that's the reality. Uh, exterior doors I spoke about already, so from that, um, getting updated non-48-year-old doors in our buildings that haven't been warped and have more accessibility, so we're working on that. Uh, Univents and HVAC, again, another thing in our capital plan, which would help make our cooling and heating systems work more efficiently to get warm and cool air into classrooms. ADA access, so we'll, we'll talk about that at our next meeting, but some of those issues can be addressed um, through short-term capital planning. And I said cooling somewhat, and what that means is that um, we can improve our cooling systems uh, in our schools, but right now our challenge is we can't control for humidity. So if you think <coughs> of air conditioning, air conditioning does two things, right? It has, sends cooling air, but also dehumidifies the room. Uh, right now our cooling systems at these schools provide cool air, but they're not providing the dehumidification element. So we could improve that, and that's in our capital plan to improve the cooling, but uh, on really hot, humid, sticky days, uh, we get sticky paper, right? We get wet floors when you have that combination. So uh, it is, we can make progress so we don't have a repeat of this fall at Wildwood, but our best case scenario isn't quite what we think of as uh, the cooling that you would need on a very hot day, which I don't want to be a climate change. I don't want to talk so much about climate change, but odds are we're going to have more of those in the future than we've had in the past. So then there's some concerns that cannot be addressed even with significant short-term capital funding. Uh, so that's open classroom design, the classroom size, those two go hand in hand. Uh, the energy use, we've gotten more efficient. You know, our boilers are more efficient, but we're not going to get to a net zero standard without some radical change, um, like either, you know, renovated or new construction. Um, the safety of the main entry, just reorganizing, you know, reorganize the whole school to move that, and you really need some construction pieces. Not, you can't just move the rooms. The lack of natural light in many classrooms is not something that's going to be fixed, you know, with short-term capital. And then the cooling I already spoke to, but we're not going to get to that uh, cooling plus dehumidification, which is what I, most would feel like is true cooling um, for that. So that's the last slide about the condition of the buildings before I get into the MSBA process. Maybe I'll pause to see if there's questions from the committee. A lot of this is information we've already Sorry, seen. Sorry, I know. Before, so no, and this <laughs> yeah. is great because I think that the, uh, the idea was to really uh, share or review a lot of this mm -hmm. information for the sake of the community. Mr. Dunley? Yeah, I'll, you know, I'll just say exactly what the chair said, which is yes, this is information we've heard before, but I think it's very important, particularly as we're trying to um, engage this, this short process, but highly engaged process with the community over the next few months, um, that, that you start from squares from, from point zero and assume zero knowledge of people coming into the room. And, this is all very educational, and you know, a, a lot of the uh, town doesn't have all the time in the world to follow every detail. So this is very helpful, and I appreciate the way in which you're, uh, in which you're presenting it. Thank you. Okay. So I'll keep going. So Amherst MSBA history. So from 2007 to 2012, multiple statements of interest were submitted for both Fort River and Wildwood schools. Uh, none of those were accepted over that time period. In the fall, late fall of 2013, the MSBA accepted Amherst's statement of interest for Wildwood School. I think it's worth noting that uh, in the statement of interest process, you have to prioritize one school over another. At that point in time, Wildwood was um, prioritized because it didn't have the updated boiler system. Uh, that was the determining factor that the then <coughs> school committee and superintendent and, and then select board <coughs> made to prioritize Wildwood, and that's why it was accepted versus Fort Rivers. It wasn't MSBA thought it was more in need. It was that locally that decision was made. Um, there was a building project developed from 2013 to 17. 
Uh, it failed to receive all the required local approvals to, approve, uh, to proceed to construction, so at that point, uh, that process concluded. And last year, in 2018, there were statements of interest submitted for both Fort River, which was prioritized, and Wildwood School, but neither statement of interest was accepted. It's hard to read from the slides. I know that's not the most enjoyable experience. Um, so um, the MSBA, I find to be incredibly um, candid, <coughs> and uh, I appreciate, and they're not watching this, I'm just saying it because it's true, um, that they, um, they, they share feedback. You ask them a direct question, they give you a direct answer, which is all you can ask for from a state agency, I think. And, and so uh, I, had multiple com I have had multiple conversations with MSBA um, in the last month or so. Yeah, I guess that would be right. Um, and they expressed no concern over the technical nature of the submission. There was no disagreement that our buildings are in need of either um, significant uh, renovation or addition or <coughs> construction. Um, however, they, they were concerned that, they didn't, that the community wasn't showing that there was a consensus for how to move forward. And given the last building project experience, again, there's no, I'm being very intentional, it's how I feel, there's no looking back for the sake of looking back, it's them telling me, you know, is the community, con does it have a, an, a plan of what it wants to do? Does, is there a consensus that the town has? Um, and that was their concern. Um, they expressed that during a site visit all the way back um, last spring, and n not as clearly as they did this, this um, December. And so they, their recommendation was, and then if we choose, if the town chooses to submit a statement of interest or statements of interest this year, that there's a formal statement around the consensus that's built. Um, that, you know, the technical part is not the part that they have questions about, it's the consensus uh, in the community that they want to make sure that is in place as they consider statements of interest for next year. And they were very blunt to say, if that's not realized, then maybe 2020 is the next time you submit statements of interest. Um, that's how uh, firmly they feel that there's a need for that to be developed in this community. Mr. Dunley? Oh, is it also true that um, another major limiting factor for FSBA <coughs> acceptance is that they have a fixed budget? You mentioned last meeting they yeah. had a quarter billion dollars committed in the pipeline and that they only get so much money from the state. Yeah, they, they were very candid to say there's more need in the state than there is dollars. Um, that while they are a relatively well-funded agency, there's two secondary projects, one that's approved and one that has a vote this spring, each of which are uh, over a quarter billion dollars. So it was 250 some odd for Somerville and I think the next one's Arlington and I think it's in the neighborhood of $300 million. So when they support these projects, when you talk about smaller projects, it, it does make it more competitive for the smaller ones when you have these large ones uh, going on. So thank you for raising that, 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 that important point. That was the kind of the other take home they said is, we'd love to support many, many of the projects. Many schools have conditions that the MSBA sees as worthy of accepting to the pipeline, but their financial ability to cover that is limited. And as, if you look at population growth in Massachusetts, when it was exp when it was when people were building a lot of schools, right? Those schools are all getting to the same age that ours at, and so there's an increasing number of schools um, that need support and need to be uh, either renovated or, you know, knocked down. So I don't want to um, then put words in your mouth or your words in your mouth that would be from their mouths. Yeah. Um, but uh, that the fact that the genuine demonstrated need across the state. Um, significantly outstrips uh, the available resources uh, is one reason why presumably uh, th there's a high hurdle to get in. So that if they think a project isn't going to succeed for any reason, um, fair or foul, um, they have other choices that are also equally as compelling for them. That's exactly right. Yeah. Okay. So a little bit on MSBA process. Um, so new statements of interest will be accepted for the core program, which is what we're talking about. Um, there's one, if you're looking for boilers or roofs, and that, that's not, you know, what we're talking about because the build schools build, the needs of these builds, uh, the needs of these buildings are more significant than that. Um, so new statements of interest are accepted until April 12, 2019. Um, statements of interest need to be formally voted by both the Amherst School Committee and then the Amherst Town Council. That's the process. Um, an important note is the statements of interest, while they're looking for consensus on, um, in the community on certain factors, 
statements of interest can include certain information because they have a robust process um, that the MSBA sets out that, that, is pretty, that is very significant. And so, for instance, being, uh, making a statement whether new construction or an ad renovation is preferred, ad addition renovation is preferred, is not something that would be warmly received by the MSBA. That would, that would come up in part of their own process. I know it's a topic that many people have asked me about and com community conversations are occurring about. And I think that's, that, that's great that we're having that conversation. For the statement of interest, that's not something that we would need to decide and actually we shouldn't decide. The second is defined site. So even though we'll have a significant amount of information about Wildwood and Fort River site, which is fantastic because of prior work and current work, uh, that's not a decision that would be made by this body or town council. That would be a building, future building committee would be making that decision as well as the, the first one I mentioned. Who the architect should be. So there's already people have asked me, who do you think would be, and, and that's not something um, that actually occurs. We don't even choose the architect in the MSBA process. We have, locally, we have three votes out of 15, and the MSBA has 12. So uh, to presume that we would include who we, the preferred architect would be uh, presumptuous and not well received. And the last one is that the specific design details or a complete educational plan. Again, that's the work of a building committee, not the work of um, the statement of, that goes into a statement of interest. Um, so we'll talk about what we need to come to consensus on, but you know, I started with what we don't need to be. Maybe that's freeing for some folks, I don't know. Um, so um, we'll talk about the, what we need to consensus on in a bit, but I, I think one of the things that I've been doing a lot of thinking, and I, I know I talk, spoke to the chair who's also done a lot of thinking, is how do we engage community to both understand the limitations um, that we have, the MSBA process, and and some of the some of the details about the history, because as I mentioned at the beginning, there's significant people in the community who've been following this incredibly closely, and then there's other people for a whole host of reasons who, you know, caught wind of the last project, but now really want to dig in because they want to support Amherst, you know, our elementary school students. They want to be in the best buildings they can, and there's a sense of urgency, which is a word I heard multiple times from committee members so far, and so um, this is my initial kind of thought as to how to proceed. So it would be scheduling nine listening sessions, and that's intentionally, um, community listening sessions, intentionally labeled that way, uh, starting in the next month, or over the next kind of five, six weeks. Um, <coughs> three sessions for in each, one in each elementary school geared towards current and future parents and guardians. Uh, three sessions, location to be determined for the broader community. And I thought actually I've talked to the town manager about engaging the town council. They may have some thoughts about preferred locations, you know, it's, I know there's five districts and not three, but um, I think that seemed like a reasonable number um, and that might be um, a nice way that the town council at least to enter, engage in this. And the last one, uh, <coughs> three sessions, one in each Amherst Elementary School specifically for school staff members. A and um, I think it's important to note that uh, however long this process takes, the school staff are the ones who are gonna be in the buildings 180 days a year. So their voices are incredibly important in this discussion as well. Um, I thought I'd ask two community leaders who are on different sides of the prior building project to co-facilitate the sessions because if we're trying to build consensus, I think one of the ways we can do it is modeling that the past building project is exactly that. It was the past building project. It didn't, it didn't come to fruition and we need to move you know, onward uh, together. And so that was sort of my thought about it. The sessions we light on presentation, probably not wildly different than this in my head anyway, that we want to get some foundational um, things that everyone can agree on are facts uh, about the MSBA process, about the building, and then the rest of the time focus on soliciting or understanding key priorities of the stakeholders. And having that interchange, that two-way communication is really critical because while it's a listening session, be able to respond and people have questions uh, that they won't want to ask and be able to have that kind of rich dialogue um, is something that I thought would be helpful because I would want people walking away not just saying, oh, I gave my input and we'll see what they do with it, but actually I did some learning not just from the presentation but from what I heard from other people. And, and I think that kind of dynamic can bring a community together much more than other forms of communication or engagement. <coughs> and have those done by the February 26th, which is, it's not the next Amherst School Committee meeting, but it's the one after that, uh, with a report from the sessions um, and propose next steps of moving forward. Um, there's a little asterisk at the bottom, but that's just about how to get communication out about these sessions. Um, and then I think I'll just keep going even if there's questions on that because the next slide sort of, it's the last slide. Um, because I tried to backwards design, and I worked with the chair on this, 
Um, if we need to get to April 12th with getting it sent in, how do we, uh, knowing that town council needs to take an affirmative vote and they're gonna need to consider, you know, just because school committee suggests something, they need to learn about it and sign on to it as well. So I was trying to backwards design how that might work. Backwards design meaning, could we start with the end in mind, which is getting a statement of interest, you know, sent, and then going backwards in weeks of how could we logically do this. I want to note that March 4th and Martha Le March 11th are not Amherst School Committee meeting dates right now. So this was Chair and I trying to look, do this task together, and do we need to add dates? And I don't see a way we can get around adding dates. Um, so if we start with that, April 1st being proposed town council vote, I've shared this with town manager, town council has not seen this presentation, so the italicized word proposed is, is in addition to the one of the title, because at least the one of the title, the first two things on here, you all can control, the last two you can't. Um, but if we think about town council being able to review and vote on a statement of interest, we need to give them that time, which then backs into a school committee vote on the 11th of March, which then backs into March 4th or so, with me making a presentation and recommendation for your consideration. Um, I don't know how to scrunch it any more than that, um, but that's what we came up with. And I would just add to that, I think at the last meeting, uh, one of our committee members had raised the point that, you know, a good point, that this is a truncated timeline, right, and a very ambitious one. Um, but again, recognizing the sense of urgency around putting in these applications because we've heard loud and clear from community members on all sides that they are very interested in us pursuing the application of the MSBA, um, that if we are to actually do this, and as the superintendent mentioned, uh, have the MSBA you know, seriously consider an application, that we want to be able to show some kind of community <coughs> support for any potential project. Uh, so this is really the timeline that we're looking at. There's not really much wiggle room there. Uh, we also wanted to, in our conversation, allow for time for community input, uh, not just the listening sessions that the superintendent yeah. outlined, but also <coughs> additional you know, uh, methods of communication that both individual committee members, but also just the community in general has for sharing information, soliciting feedback from networks and things like that. So we, we were trying to be mindful of that um, and hopefully giving enough time for, you know, for folks to, to respond to that. Um, so I don't know if the, the committee has any questions or comments or anything that they want to raise with the superintendent right now. Mr. Dunley? I mean, so uh, first of all, just process-wise, I don't want to go on for too long because we do have school community discussion after public comment, mm -hmm. so, uh, but just to respond like kind of immediately to this general idea. So it's funny, you know, I was hoping for some, something like this leading up to the statement of interest date in April. And my first thought was like, oh, I'm gonna have to like, you know, say you need to be like more aggressive in your timeline. So I don't think I need to say that. <laughs> uh, I think this is pretty aggressive, but I mean, like the chair said, this is, this is what we have. This is the opportunity that we have. If April 12th isn't moving, that's what the MSBA sets. So we either don't try and do this, or we try and do this. And I, so to me, it's a kind of a no-brainer that we, we, we forge ahead and, and, and we see if we can do it. And I think one advantage too is that it's not like we're starting from scratch. It's not like we just found out about the need for the buildings yesterday and that the community has spent no time over the last X number of years and that we're gonna be shocked about the issues and themes that come up. I mean, we could probably have a pretty good guess of what some of them might be. Um, you know, so that being said, it is a pretty aggressive timeline. Five weeks to, to, do, to do those sessions. To do those nine sessions, I think, is achievable. I, th I think, you know, like, like most of these things, communication is the key, and so articulating that it's not just these nine opportunities that you have to, to provide your input, and if you don't get there, if you don't have childcare or whatever, you know, then tough luck. Um, but you know, articulating that there, that there are opportunities before, during, and after that are more than just perfunctory, more than just, oh, email school committee, whatever you want, but are, we actually will take your input seriously, and it will be as you know, valued as if you were coming up and speaking at public comment. Because also, some people don't like coming and speaking in public as well, so it can be a, a difficult thing. Um, the idea of, of um, listening sessions, I, I, I like. Um, I, I like it, to be honest, for this particular problem, better than the mechanism, mechanism of, a, of a survey for trying to gauge public sentiment. I think, I think trying to gauge public sentiment in general is, is an impossible problem to solve. <laughs> it's one of those core problems of representatives of, of anything. So what does the public think is, is very difficult. And I think in this particular problem, there's so much background that has to first be presented, you know, all that context that you presented in your, in your slides. 
plus, you know, a half a dozen other financial restrictions um, that we that we didn't mention, but we could go on at, uh, at, at length about. Um, there's, you know, there's so much context that you provide to then get a meaningful answer to, to a, a survey that we want high participation from, I think would be difficult. Plus, I don't, I don't think it's that we're looking to see, you know, whether a particular opinion is at a, a very specific percent. You know, we're, we're not looking for, you know, do you, do you want A or B and does it cross a 68% threshold or something like that. We want to get a general sense of where people are and I think this is a good way to do it. I, I would be a little concerned about the the skill level of facilitation, not that I have any <laughs> doubt about the sincerity of you or, th or the other volunteers. And uh, by the way, I think the notion of getting reps from um, from people that supported and opposed the, the past project and were known for that w is, is great. Because um, this is really about, I think, the superintendent school committee facilitating consensus, not forcing consensus. <laughs> um, so I, I think that's great. Um, you know, that being said, this is an intense thing that a lot of people care deeply about because it is so serious. We haven't talked about it for so long. Um, but you know, being able to, to work that effectively such that it produces the outcome you want, I don't know, it's, it's, it's a little, it's a skill, right, to be able to facil facilitate a group. So I don't know if, if maybe we, we want to think, I mean, you know, I know the clock is ticking, but about, you know, professional facilitation, whether there's low dollar consultants we might think about. Um, I don't know, just sort of throwing it out there because I don't want to, I want to set people up for, for success. Um, but yeah, those are just my initial thoughts. So I, I saw uh, Mr. Nakajima and then Ms. McDonald. Yeah, and I, I just want to say something very briefly because I know we're going to have time to talk again and also want to give people uh, as, as much time as they want to, to speak. Um, one of the things, interestingly enough, when, when the superintendent and I were talking about this subject probably a month ago or more because, I mean, many of us have been banging the drum that we needed to get organized around what we were going to do next, both the immediate conditions of the buildings, the intermediate needs, and then how we um, either substantially renovate them or replace them, and some sense of urgency around it. And you, you made the comment at one point that you thought we had until you know June or July to get town-wide consensus. We need to put an SOI in, but then we need to, we need to help see what we can get for consensus. And um, your language changed publicly recently at a meeting where you said, we have to get consensus by April. And that stuck in my head, but since I think the conversation we have is more private, right. I thought, well, I'm not going to ask you publicly why you're saying something differently. And so we caught up about the issue. And what you said was the feedback from the MSBA was, in fact, so clear about um, whatever level of consensus is, is created in town around what our needs are, where we're going, that, in fact, if it wasn't included in the official SOI, the official application, then they were not, they were, they were not, they were going to discount it. They were not going to treat it at the same level of seriousness as if it was included officially. And that really, that really struck me on a couple of different levels. I mean, one, uh, you know, where we're going is not going to be completely manufactured, right? right. We're going to have to get there together and we're going to have to do it. <coughs> um, if we don't if we fail this re year, and I hate to call it failure, but if we start this conversation and we're aggressive and we fail this year, it will not be entirely in vain because if we, let's say for sake of argument, people in the room all raised their hand and said, I don't want to do this. Let's just submit next year. This is going to be too hard. We would have to start the conversations now anyway, right? Because the point is when we, we have to get there, there's also a real felt sense of urgency around the condition of the buildings. So one of the reasons I'm saying this is because there's an interesting exercise, and actually the chair... Uh, said this to me, the, to me the other day, and I thought it was really interesting, is what we're looking for is what is in, what can we actually agree on? So my guess is coming out of the last project or um, in general a lot of the debates in town we've been having, we can figure out a lot of the areas of disagreement. <coughs> to me, one of the interesting questions is what are the areas, where is there common ground, where is there overlap, um, where are there areas in which there's a common commitment core commitment that we have to improve these facilities, improve this learning environment. And as, as Mr. Demling said, that we can't manufacture that consensus, but I actually think as hard as this process is with this timeline, it's worth going through together because if I, I, no one would be in this room right now, I'm confident no one would be here, if they already didn't feel some level of urgency around improving our schools. 
I already said that really clearly in my view last time, much more trenchantly than I plan on saying tonight, on the urgency I feel around it. Um, so great, that's a starting point, right? And so these conversations are gonna be critical to getting there. Thank you. Ms. McDonald? Um, <clears throat> I understand, we have public comment now and school committee discussion later, so I'm not gonna go on, but I do um, have questions and thoughts about the, the listening sessions. I think it's a great starting point and proposal, but um, you mentioned earlier um, about what we don't need to build consensus on or shouldn't include in that and that we would later discuss what we should be building consensus on. And is that for now, or do you, is that sort of ap when we begin the full discussion, school committee discussion? Yeah, so I think they're looking for um, <coughs> the kind of information that's not, again, not about, I'm, I know I'm going back to that, but I, I'm doing it intentionally. Not about, you know, specifically the building design or what it'll, what it'll look like, but they need to know some core questions. You know, are we planning on um, replacing both buildings in some way, shape, or form, uh, or not with this project. Um, and that's pretty much, you know, in my conversations with them, the core question they need to know, and as a result of that, there'll be an enrollment study if we were fortunate to get in, but they need to know a little, you know, a little more content, context than that uh, about how that would, how that's going to work. Um, so th that's really at it, the gestalt of it. What they asked me was around, uh, you know, you're looking to replace both buildings with one, is there some consolidation idea, not that it's necessarily the same as the last time, or is this looking more at the solitary, um, whatever is the preferred or prioritized school? That, that's at its yep. core. Right. Yeah. I, I'm building on that, I apologize, but um, um, Ms. Adonis and I were in a meeting with you in yeah. the NSBA last summer yeah. over the statement of interest, and it just reminded me of that conversation. Mm -hmm. Because when they were asking us at the time being what we were thinking, um, we probed their thinking. Yeah. And we said, well, wh what are you looking for? We weren't saying, like, we want to tell you what you want to hear, although we might have wanted to do that. <laughs> <laughs> but it was more a matter of we need to understand better what you're trying to get at. And they were, their answer was extraordinarily pragmatic. They said, look, if we, and I'm making up the global number for the, for, for the sake of argument, but look, if we have uh, $200 million to hand out for projects, um, we need to know whether your building is a $60 million building or a $45 million building. Is it a $70 million building or a $30 million renovation? Because that, because they're, when they think, go back to their desks right. and do their little spreadsheets, they need to figure out where, where does a puzzle piece fit into the, the larger pu picture of where they're doing projects. And so for them, it makes a huge, I mean, literally just if it's like a 350 kid building, or it's just for the sake of argument, a 600 or 700 kid building. Those are two totally, from their perspective, those, they told us those are two totally different kinds of projects and would be slotted in differently into their, their thinking. And so they need clarity, right? Yeah. Because that was my memory. It's a bit of a Tetris puzzle is what I remember them saying, more or less. Kind of <laughs> yeah, yeah. And budget-wise, yeah. 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 I think, you know, I'm speculating, which is, I want to be cautious about doing, but I think the other thing that, that I could imagine them wondering about is because the size of the school was an area of contention in the, in the prior project, and again, I'm not trying to open that up for debate, but I think everyone would agree factually that, that was, there were people who disagreed on that issue. Um, they want to see, is there consensus on some solution? Because there's people who feel really passionately, felt very passionately uh, on both sides of that issue the last time, and is, you know, where are, where are we, be, we being the community, not we being we. Uh, on that very question. So I think there's there's everything you, Mr. Nakajima said I agree with, but there's also some pragmatic pieces from them of wanting to make sure that there's community consensus on a path forward. Thank you. Or is that, does yeah. that answer all you? Okay. Yeah. Okay. I wasn't sure there was some additional. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, and, and I also, you know, I don't want to uh, take too much time. I actually want to make sure that we do get to hear from, there's a significant number of community members here tonight, which is wonderful. Um, we want to make sure that we allow uh, time to hear from them. Um, I do want to say there was one comment that Mr. Nakajima made just a moment ago about uh, you know the, the clarity of, of getting a consensus um, around the, the, the SOI. And I also just you know want to make a point, I think, based on the presentation that you just made, Dr. Morris, that um, there is still not, even, even 
that you know that the MSBA has indicated an, in a strong interest in having the community express uh, support for moving forward. You know, very big picture kind of thing. There's still not a guarantee, and so you know, I don't say that to throw any water on it on this process or to you know try to to squash conversation or, or discussion around this, but really just because I think it's important for us to go into this eyes wide open, right? And that we are having a <coughs> conversation amongst ourselves and with our community about what we we want to have happen. Um, and with a potential project, it doesn't necessarily mean that we can dive into, at this point, any details or that we are ready to move beyond that big picture sort of agreement and the reason for that, again, is because, you know, A, we're not sure that this would even result in an accepted application, um, but B, because there's so much of this that would end up getting worked out with the community and at a later stage with the building committee and all of that. So um, I do think it's important to help get that straight as we talk to town council members and as we talk to individual members of the community. Um, that this really is the very initial beginning stages, but we, we really just want to try to see if we can get some support and a consensus from the community to move forward with the project. Does that make sense, Mr. Dunling? Yes, um, although the devil's in the details, right? And so if I was to, tr if I'm thinking of every possible um, issue, theme, argument, design decision <laughs> about the building projects and whether it slots appropriately in this big picture um, pre SOI phase, or whether it slots appropriately, appropriately to the building committee phase, I don't have the answer about all of those. Like, I, I, I won't mention them now because I want to make sure we get to public comment and keep saying that. Um, uh, but I think that's, that's one thing we need to clarify a little bit more, right? Um, uh, particularly prior to the listening sessions, uh, so that it's not just an open-ended, hey, what do, you, what do you want in a building, right? And so it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's, maybe, it's maybe a little bit uh, framed uh, about these are, these are the sort of things we've identified as the big picture issues that will that the MSBA is looking for, and and this is what will help us out uh, in advance of the April twelfth uh, submission. So, with that, unless there's something burning that you <laughs> well, I think it's relevant before public comment, and it's very brief. Is to that if it's okay yeah. to that point, you know, the way I was envisioning the listening sessions, I should have said this earlier, was to have kind of non-leading prompts that the community could respond to. So you're right about the framing piece, right? Because if we get on a conversation about new versus ad reno, that's a really helpful feedback for a future building committee. Um, and it's not that it's not worth talking about, but it's probably not worth talking about now. It's not gonna get us to a consensus place on an item that we need consensus. And maybe it gets us to consensus on something that we would need years from now. So I do think having some open-ended prompts to, mm -hmm. to start a conversation uh, was sort of in my mindset of how to kind of frame and solicit meaningful feedback um, that we can bring back here. Yeah, and so, okay, so um, on the agenda, we actually, we do things also a little bit differently, and I should have uh, said this at the very start of the meeting. Um, we purposefully put public comment kind of in the middle of our meeting tonight, um, primarily because we wanted to have a presentation from Dr. Morris to help set, you know, some of the, the framework for our conversation. Uh, but also because typically speaking for our school committee meetings, we have public comment at the start of our meetings, and then uh, oftentimes, you know, community members will leave after they make their public comments, and we don't usually respond to those comments. Um, so tonight, even though we haven't set up a format for like a Q&A kind of forum, so we won't be responding directly to questions or things like that from the, from the community, uh, we felt like this would help be more of a relevant conversation if we could have the presentation followed by public comment and then followed by committee discussion. Um, so with that, I'm going to open up uh, public comment now. And um, as a reminder, our, if anyone wants to make a public comment, you can come up to the microphone. You have three minutes to speak. Um, we will be adhering to the three minute rule tonight. Um, and what I would suggest is if you have more you wanna say and the three minutes is up, that maybe um, you know you take a seat and you can come back um, and uh, continue your comments after others have had a chance to speak. There are a lot of people here tonight, and we want to make sure that everybody has a chance to speak. Um, we have about 40 minutes slotted, but I've heard from committee members that we you know are interested in and want to hear from as many folks as we possibly can. So we will extend that if we need to. Um, but with that, uh, I will open up public comments. So if anyone wants to speak, please um, come up to the microphone and state your name. 
Anastasia, do you want me to set up the screen where people can see? Them, uh, you or? can do that. If you have it set up, that's great. <laughs> yeah, I have it on my phone, too, It'll take me a minute, here. but I can listen to the comment and Sure, that that's yeah. great. I'm sorry. Hi, my name is Ira Brick. I live on Strong Street. I sent you a letter, but I'm also going to read it so people can hear it. I moved my family to Amherst in 1993, aiming to live somewhere between Florence and Pelham. As we had two young children, one about to enter first grade, my scouting mission included visiting every elementary school in that target territory. And when visiting Wildwood School, sat in on a classroom where I couldn't locate the teacher for quite a while though all the children were not quite quietly engaged in a project. I finally realized that the teacher was busy with an energized group of children under a large table in the corner. I made a major life decision to live near Wildwood based on that gut impression. Both our children grew into themselves during their years there. They were not obviously harmed by the open classroom design that seemed like a good idea when constructed. Also, I taught elementary school after college running an experimental free school, K to six age kids, all together in a structure that made open classrooms seem parochial. I understand that the struggle over our school de redevelopment has become quite unpleasant between those who supported the co-located school plan versus others who thought it was too flawed and that it was less risky to take our chances getting funding later for a more ideal plan. And I re recently heard that the reason we were again denied for funding is that the state feels Amherst is not in a ready state to receive it because of our discord, which leaves us incapable of spending it wisely. May I suggest taking a breath plus a step back, understanding the timeline which you discussed. And to help do that, consider a unique effective exercise that could simultaneously get us more on the same page, albeit a new page, by using the services of the world-class design firm IDEO to build perfect schools. IDEO is an international organization but has a Cambridge office. They use a magical strategy to think about structure and function using a team of people, us, having every sensible and wacky perspective, going for the biggest audacious ideas in a process to design something that is both spectacular and practical. Some of what they've designed are the first computer mouse, steel case chairs, federal offices, and as you can see in the links below, the perfect shopping cart and cubicle. And if anybody just Googles IDEO shopping cart or cubicle, you'll see that. I think that for Amherst to have IDEO guide them through the design of our own perfect school, it may increase our goodwill and collaboration and sharpen our focus on what important criteria belong on our checklist aside from whether to co-locate or how to divide grades. Think of it as a way we can escape from our current Chinese finger trap. The trick there is to ease up, loosen the tension, and slide out of the trap. I hope enough members of the school committee and town council, plus other school and town leaders and influencers, will be open to this low-risk experiment that could be great for what ails us. I have not been a central player in this dispute, but would be more than interested in working with others to bring this possible solution to town. three school age children, one in the elementary school and two here at the high school. Um, I, come, I come to thank you for your leadership and your initiative in, in moving this process along at a rapid pace because we all share that sense of, of urgency. I would like to encourage you all to continue to keep our, uh, as a community, focused on what the MSBA has tasked us to do which, and what it has tasked us not to do. So. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hi, my name's uh, Kip Prather. I'm a sixth grade teacher at Crocker Farm. Uh, when Dr. Morris brought up the temperatures uh, in the schools, it's very real. Um, I'm in a particular room in Crocker Farm that is not like the rest of Crocker Farm. It's the upper corner and gets uh, south and west exposure. And I put a thermometer on my board and it was in the upper 80s. Um, but that's not Crocker Farm State. Crocker Farm is, is, uh, has pretty decent um, coolers 
compared to Wildwood and Fort River. And I didn't get the, I don't have the temperatures for Fort River and Wildwood, but I did report my temperatures because I had a thermometer on the board um, to my principal and he confirmed to me that uh, Wildwood was experiencing similar conditions. And I know firsthand what 87 degrees feels like teaching kids and education was way out of my list. Um, I had fans blowing everywhere and um, kids were, you know, really melting. It was sort of like hydrate, hydrate, um, you know, try to keep the kids as cool as possible with the lights down and um, it's not conducive to uh, good learning. Um, and I wasn't thinking of that when I showed up tonight. Uh, I just thought that uh, when Dr. Morris brought it up. But I would, my feeling about the, the vote two years ago was that there was um, a lot of uh, misconception and confusion amongst, you know, I'll just call it what it is. I think a lot of the people who voted no uh, were voting kind of out of in this, in this uh, state. And I, I, in my opinion, I don't think they had enough knowledge of what it meant if this doesn't go through. And I would urge the, uh, the committee and then obviously the town council and Dr. Morris to push the uh, real simple um, explanation of what we're looking for and what we want to build and what happens, what's the reality, the timing. Um, my, my friend who was here a little while ago gave me some insight, uh, Tom Davies, on the timing on, on what happens when we don't, when this doesn't go through. And uh, I, I, my guess is, from what he told me, it, it's quite a long time before we're going to see things. So I, I think it's, it's urgent that we act. Um, I'm sensing that, you're, that urgency is, is in the room, so I, I'm happy about that. Um, but I would say a real simple way of getting the information to the residents of Amherst would be uh, effective. Um, and that the priority would be students and staff, getting them into a sound, safe, and healthy building, and then what happens if we don't act. Thank you. Uh, my name is Melissa Giroux, and I always talk too long at these meetings, so I'll try to keep it short. Um, I, I think if there's anything good that came out of uh, the proposal not passing in town meeting, and I, I actually really, really struggle to find it um, personally, and I'll, yeah, but uh, if there's anything good, it's that I think since then, because it's such a complicated process, there's a lot more um, information, you know, that the that town members have, and there's a lot more information in general about how people learn and about um, what an integrated school really is, or what an integrated school system really is, and how important um, preschool is, accessible preschool is to life outcomes of kids and families and communities. So. My hope is that even though two years ago and before that, just listening to a lot of these conversations, it felt like um, integration was on everyone's list, but it was never number one and never number two. I mean, talking to voters, right? Um, I hope that that changes, you know, that, that this we keep in mind that um, you can have equity and excellence and that all of our kids deserve um, a great education. So I really hope um, there's been so much research that's gone into, uh, you know, really um, public newspapers and journals about, you know, since DeVos and Trump and Black Lives Matter um, about what true integration is as opposed to, um, you know, just having a lot of different color kids in your class. And um, yeah, I really hope that we can learn together and, and I hope that you guys <coughs> continue as that original plan did to make um, equity and integration a priority, so thanks. Thank you. I just wanna say there's a few folks that are in the back of the room um, standing, just which is totally fine if that's how you prefer, but there's also a whole row of seats that are open over here if you wanna come up to the front. No pressure. My name's Jean Fay. I am a special education paraeducator in my 21st year at Crocker Farm. 
I'm also a parent of three children that went through the Amherst public school systems, and I just happen to be the president of the Amherst Pelham Education Association. Last October, I gave a presentation with photos to uh, the Amherst School Committee um, that showed the horrendous conditions of some of our buildings. And um, I was appalled, and uh, I know that, that you were all appalled at the conditions because the photos really spoke uh, loudly. Um, Dr. Morris spoke earlier tonight about the conditions of our buildings being challenges to providing an excellent education to all our students, but I actually would take that a step further. I would say that we're at the point now where the conditions of the buildings are becoming barriers to providing an excellent education to all of our students. And um, my colleague, Kip, mentioned um, Crocker Farm, which is a building that's considered to have no problems. <coughs> His classroom saw temperatures in the high 80s. Well, today I took a photo of a thermometer in a, a, a building, a room in my building. The temperature was 42 degrees. So our staff and our students are in learning environments where they cannot succeed right now. We are in a town that values education. If we value education, then what are we doing? We really need to fix this now. This is a priority. This is beyond urgent. Thank you for all that you've done. Um, I want to make sure that the community knows that the school committee has really listened to the educators on this issue, and I thank you for that. But um, this is urgent. Um, my name is Janet McGowan. Um, both of my kids went through Fort River. Um, and I have a couple, a few questions and then sort of a comment. Um, I'm wondering if the MSB, MSBA was aware of the Fort River Feasibility Committee process and all the good work that they've done. And I'm hoping that community members will also learn about the work um, during the public outreach process because it, I thought they came up with seven basic goals that almost anyone could agree on. And I thought that work, um, th and then the different options they had of, of different renovation builds were just super illuminating to me. So I think that information should be brought to the community. I think if you're going to have a community process, you need to be very clear about what, you n what the community needs to reach consensus on. And how will you know if the community has reached consensus without a survey? Because, you know, it's the middle of the winter. There's lots of people, you know, you, you can you reach out to your circles, but your circles aren't the residents of Amherst. And there's tons of people that would not be reached out. And, you know, a lot of times if there's a snow day, you've lost one of your meetings, or maybe if 30 people showed up. But 7,000 people voted on this. And so we need to reach those people. I think in terms of the clarity of what you're asking people, I think what I'm hearing here is the issue is, does, does Amherst want to consolidate their two smaller schools into a larger one? That's, if that's the core question, um, the question really is asking, does the community want two smaller schools of about 350 to 400 students, or do they want a large consolidated school of 700 or so? I think that's a question people can answer. Um, you can ask them in a survey, you know, reach out to them, get information back from them. There are lots of residents in this town that their kids have gone through the schools or they have gone through the schools or their cr grandkids are going through these schools. So we have generations of people um, there's lots of educators that have strong views on that, um, and there's lots of thoughtful residents. I mean, in the last process, I can't tell you how many conversations I had with people who just were asking like super pi picky questions and you know about the different plans. And so I think that if you're going to look for consensus, you have to be clear about what you're asking about it and actually ask a lot of people. Um, otherwise, you know, I just think I just think I don't understand how you could do that without a survey and really pushing information out to the community and having like as many avenues back. And if that's the question, I think you can get an answer to that. Hi, 
Hi, my name is Mary Clark. Um, I sent a letter to the committee and I really thank you very much for all of your hard work. Um, I, am, I have questions about the SOI, which are mainly um, how soon can we possibly be successful in changing anything that currently exists? For example, Fort River, my son's school, um, I don't know if he's gonna be able to even have anything different exist. Um, he's a second grader in the time that he will have there. Is there, what's the timeline, I guess, is the question I have um, about the SOI were to be successful. Um, the other is, I guess, the feeling that anything <laughs> would help. I mean, I just, the urgency <coughs> I, I can't even underscore, but I also think about the, the timeline that Dr. Morris recommended, thinking about from the MSPA process, 50 years in the future, too. Like, this is not about my son's elementary school experience at this point, it is, he is experiencing it. I don't like it. He has great teachers, he has great friends, he has a great experience because he overcomes that. But as several people have already noted, there are significant <coughs> barriers to that success every day. I, that, that it, they are multiplied with, with problems, I think. With, uh, in individual children are not learning well in those environments. I think we're talking about also getting people to think about what the future of Amherst is also. That this is, we're building for 50 years in the future and that these buildings should not exist this way. It, they're, they're absolutely unacceptable, and I wish that to change. Can you please tell us what we need to do to make it work? I don't know how to fix the divisiveness in the community about everything, but how can we come together as a community to unite behind investing not just right now, but for the next five decades? I just, if you could help us we as community members might be able to help too. Um, that's the, the plea that I have. And again, I think there are lots of, again, details about getting into who, how could this be arranged and what's the best way to get feedback, but I really appreciate you offering the opportunity to communicate with you and for your really sincere listening. I, I, I think that's a huge um, benefit to me. But again, I'm just gonna underscore it. urgency. Tear it down would be a good option. Replace it with something new would be a great option. I'm like, that's, yay, that's what I'll, I'll vote for. Thank you. I'm Maria Kapicki, a uh, parent of elementary school kids. So um, elementary schools, all of our schools are community resources. And ultimately to get to the solution that we all want, uh, which is to address both of these schools, the question being essentially sequentially or simultaneously, um, is going to require community response to do that. You're going to have to get consensus not only of the people that you can reach with listening sessions and the folks that can come and attend meetings and do that, but you're going to need to get enough people, hopefully a large majority, to truly bring our town together. And I think that um, uh, if you want to know what people are going, how do you, what is that thing that is going to bring a large majority of people together? I think that there's really no other way to do that than to ask them to provide enough information to say these are our basic choices, give some information that we can all agree upon. Of, I, we have choice A, B, C, and these are the pros and cons of all of those. Explain that, give that information, do monumental work to get that information out to as many people as possible, most especially to the folks who can't come to listening sessions, who can't, um, who don't have the resources to, to be heard, who can't do that, but everybody's gonna have to, to weigh in on this. Um, and I think in order to explain to the MSBA, this is, this is the consensus that will result in some future time and us going forward and putting the period on this project, whatever project or projects it may be, I don't see how you can do that without doing some kind of survey, without asking um, and getting a response back and saying what's acceptable, what, what, can, we, what can we get behind. Um, I'm concerned that if we just do listening sessions and we don't get that, it's, we're 
going to be making decisions based on speculation and based on sampling bias um, of who's weighed in. So that's my concern. But thank you very much for, for taking this on. Uh, my name is Paula Lima Jones, and um, so my comment might seem like the antithesis of what everyone is saying, uh, but it's it's not meant to be. I do um, really appreciate the efforts um, that everyone is saying about having community input. Um, I'm relatively new to Amherst, and one of the things that I notice about this community is that we have a people with a lot of opinions, and um, I think that's awesome. And I think that um, I would also like to hear from this process more from the educators, more from um, folks who have done this research. Um, I know that a survey had gone out, and I think you know, if that survey in the previous process had gone out about whether I liked a K through six, I might have said yes, because that's all I knew. I find myself to be a very educated person, but I don't know what I don't know. You know that's not my area of expertise. So in this process that we're also giving the information, not just, or, or we're letting the community know that we're hearing what you're saying, but we're also, you know, putting into the mix kind of the, the research base, the evidence-based um, practices. So thank you. I'm um, Lillian Kravitz. I used to teach at the high school for 32 years, and now I'm a uh, grandmother of a child that will be starting kindergarten in Wildwood. <laughs> so um, if we could go back to the slide of what you don't want, they don't want input on, mm -hmm. I think that would be helpful. Yep. Because I think in having these listening sessions, I'm afraid a lot of that is going to come up. Mm -hmm. um, so by April 12th, they don't want to know if it's new construction or addition or renovation that's preferred, right? I mean, that's going to be such a <laughs> major discussion. Uh, Defining the site, is it going to be the Wildwood site, the Fort River site, or both? And then in terms of the specific design that we, you know, enclosed classrooms that have space and light, and how do we not engage in that conversation at these listening sessions and still get consensus for what you need to produce? That's what's confusing me. <laughs> I'm going to say something like a pencil or uh, no? no? Maybe it is. Okay. Thank you. Nah. Um, You're always welcome. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Derek Shea. I'm, uh, I'm the principal at Crocker Farm, but we've also um, got two kids in the school system. Um, I'll just say a couple of quick things. Um, so I, uh, I worked at Fort River for eight years. Um, I loved it. Um, but I just want to go back to something. Uh, I don't know if Melissa's still in the audience. Uh, Melissa. So Melissa said something earlier, uh, really important about um, equity and I think excellence and integration. And Dr. Mike Morris sitting here worked at Fort River for how long, Mike? Five, six years. Um, it's genuinely really difficult to accomplish some of those things um, when you're working in a building that really makes it difficult for fairly large numbers of kids to, uh, I was a guidance counselor there, so I was working with some of the, some kids who were at risk and, and who needed um, some assistance. And so it was genuinely a struggle sometimes to get to that place, uh, Melissa, when you've got a building that really didn't make sense in, in lots of ways. Um, my two kids um, went to um, Wildwood for the longest time. I've told this story a number of times. When Mark's Meadow closed and they went to Wildwood, they said they don't care as long as Nick's the principal and Bill's the bus driver. <laughs> and so some of that was true and then some of it didn't quite work out because I know one of my kids struggled with the competing noise that took place in, 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 the, in the room and, and it wasn't easy for one of my kids because of that. Um, I was fortunate enough to, to go to high school to work for a while and then I went to work at Crocker <coughs> Farm nine years ago. I was giving a family a tour today and um, 
So Crocker Farm has some has some faults, but we've got a picture window in every room, uh, walls. We've got this huge, beautiful cafeteria with a brilliant big ceiling. So you can have lunch there and you make all the noise you want and it's not really noisy. Uh, we've got a beautiful library. Um, Kip, Mr. Prather here, he sent me that uh, 87 degrees thing on August 25th, the first day of school. It was outrageously hot in his room. It was 42 de degrees today in the gym. That's where it was 42 degrees today. It was really difficult to be in there. You can warm up, but it's still 42 degrees. I should just say my last thing is this. This is something you just remember. Um, so if you've got heating in your house, or and some folks have got air conditioning, right? So you, so you press a button and the heat comes on, right? And then you press a button and the AC comes on. That's not how it works in our schools. <laughs> it takes a week for it to turn over from one to the other. So it's a big guessing game. So Doug Peon, our top electrician guy, says to me, When's the, what do you think? When do you think the weather, I'm not the greatest with the weather, when do you think we should change it over, Derek? I don't know, Doug. I haven't looked at the weather recently. <laughs> so it, sometimes you can be moving into something where you're turning over to heat when it's going to be another 80 degree week and you've actually just had to do it because you have to do it. So that's all our schools. Some things need to give. I don't know how we get there, but definitely some things need to give. Thank you. Um, I was here during the presentation by the architect of the Fort River Feasibility Committee, and he, they, they had the committee, which you know had a whole variety of views, they had seven goals for the new building or the change or the renovation or whatever you want to call it. Could you read that out to the to the group? Because I th everybody who saw that I thought was like, oh yeah, that's what we want. And so I wonder if that could be a kind of, even at this meeting, sort of a unifying thing. And that, you know, the committee has worked for like a year, year and a half through a lot of issues. So I wonder if someone could just read those out to the group. We can, we can try to look at that. So Jenna Marquard, one very um, quick thought exercise that might be helpful before these listening sessions is to actually <laughs> draft what that statement of support might look like that you submit with the application. Not the content of it, but the structure. Because I think a lot of the questions that have come up about what exactly is the consensus going to be on, how do we know we reached it, all of those things, if you mentally think through what that statement would look like now might be actually helpful in driving what those conversations look like. So just a small process. Thank you. Hi. Um, I hadn't necessarily planned to speak tonight, but um, it's Krista Osterling Rising. And my daughter went through Crocker Farm, my younger daughter, starting in third grade, and that was about 20 years ago. And I think it was at the very end of her time there that they had the renovation. Um, my concern <coughs> is that I think there were a lot of people who had children in the schools that desperately needed to be renovated and who were who felt that it was very urgent that it be done immediately and I can understand that feeling but I think what a lot of people may not have understood is that some of us and I am one of these people felt that it needed to be done right that the most important thing was the children <coughs> and that the proposal that had been proposed would have been disastrous at least that's how I felt um, I felt that it would be bad for the children in every way. It would have been bad educationally, and I read articles that talked about research that said that this was true and that the teachers hadn't been in favor of the proposal that was put forward because of that. It would have been bad emotionally, and I can say this from my own experience with my oldest daughter for whom transitions were difficult and uh, very difficult. And I had a, a conversation at one point with Eric, I hope you don't mind my saying that, where he uh, said that when he came to Amherst, his family moved several times, and that was traumatic. That was the word he used. Um, and I, I hope you don't mind my quoting you on that, Eric. But um, I want it to be right for the kids. I want the buildings to be 
healthy buildings, I want the heat to be right, I want all of those things to be right, but I don't want the kids to be rushed from one, to, to be transitioned three times in elementary school from one school to another. I don't think that's a healthy situation. Uh, it would have been terrible for my oldest daughter. That's why I felt so strongly <coughs> that it was a terrible proposal. And I am still not sure who came up with it, although I've been told several times that it was Maria Garrick. I don't know what her educational background was, but I thought it was a disastrous proposal. I thought it was, as I said, I thought it would have been bad educationally, very bad emotionally for my daughter, and also I felt that it would be bad environmentally. And we're handing a planet to the kids that's already in danger environmentally. Why bust them all over the place more than is necessary? Um, I just felt that if we're gonna come up with a proposal, it has to be the right one. It has to be good for the kids. It has to be good buildings. And I was looking at people who wanted to rush into a proposal because they wanted the buildings to be fixed. And I understand that the buildings need to be fixed, but I want them to be right for the kids. And I thought that the reason there was so much divisiveness was that people who had ki kids in the buildings who felt that the buildings were in bad condition, who knew they were in bad condition, were assuming that it was about money, that people didn't want to pay for our new buildings and they, you know, they had the wrong motives for not wanting the schools to be passed, and that's not true. Um, and I, I'm just gonna say one more thing, and that is that uh, I think it was Patty Stein who had been on the select board, if I'm getting her name right. Uh, there was a very tiny article in the paper, in the Gazette, where she wrote a letter saying, or it was a letter, a little article saying, I opposed this school for a number of reasons, and one of them was that she had spoken with um, I think a superintendent or teachers and superintendents at another school system that had put through a system like that, a co-located school where the kids went from one, one school to another in elementary school and they really regretted it. They really regretted it. And she said, I don't, you know, we already built uh, Wildwood and Fort River. They were supposed to be state of the art. That open classroom idea was considered to be a great idea. Now people don't feel that way. And I think it's probably not a good idea myself. I don't really know, my kids were, my daughter was in Fort River. But we have to do it right this time. I don't wanna rush into a bad plan. That's not fair to the kids, we're just gonna regret it down the road. We need to do it right. And that's why people voted against it. They, they really wanted to do it right Thank for you. the kids. Weber and I've had two children go through the schools, uh, Amherst schools, and I guess just my observation is um, as we're going through this process for community input, maybe to extend the why so everybody that doesn't have children or haven't had children go through can also appreciate and support this. Um, we all know the schools are falling apart and without a safe, comfortable environment for our children, they're not going to get a good education without that strong instruction and a good facility. And so I feel strongly that uh, we need to, you know, if we have a good, strong education, then we're going to have a strong economy. People are going to want to come here. It's going to build the tax base. We're going to have people that this is a sought-after place rather than leaving. And I think me building and talking about that bigger picture, about the importance not only of education for all of us that have kids and really appreciate it, but what does it do for our community and really building that bigger why. And I just want to second, I think a facilitator has to be as well trained to really run a good meeting. I thought that was a good point. So my suggestion would be to get some um, qualified trained facilitators um, as we go through this rather than have any kind of inherent bias come out or people that don't have that training. Uh, I don't know the individuals, but that's just my recommendation. But anyway, so um, just to reiterate, um, I appreciate all that you're doing. I appreciate you taking the time and listening to community and the importance of an education is not only important to the children and the parents of those children, but to the community and to the strength of the economy of that community. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Hi, 
I'm Catherine Oppie. Um, and uh, I just wanted, I, I wasn't going to speak, but I, but I, I just want to follow up on something that Wendy Weber said. Um, but first, I just wanted to begin by thanking the school committee and thanking the superintendent for um, your urgency, your understanding of the urgency of this and all the work that you are putting into um, helping our students be in buildings with windows and walls. Um, and, you know, we've heard so many people tonight talk about um, what it's like to try to learn and teach in these buildings, what the conditions of the buildings are, and, and uh, listening um, to some of the educators and thinking about the fact that now the buildings are actually acting as a barrier to learning. Um, so, but to follow up on what, um, what the f uh, previous speaker said, as we go forward and as we try to reach consensus, um, and we're all focused on the schools right now, but also to understand and I think put into context that the schools, the elementary schools in Amherst are a department of the larger town, and that there are several very important projects coming before uh, are, are in front of our town and, inf and, and, and looking for very limited capital resources. Um, and the school is just one of them. But, but there are community members who feel equally passionate and feel it's equally important that we have a new fire station or that the library be renovated because so many people use it or that the DPW, you know, uh, all of the things that you have all heard before, but I think in educating, as we go forward educating the community and trying to reach consensus, I think we really do need to put, that money is not unlimited and that we really need to put the schools and um, in, a, in the larger context of, of the town. So thank you. We don't have that immediately at our disposal, and I think Dr. Morris just walked away, so he's kind of the only person. Um, <coughs> um, I'm sorry, so you wanted to read the seven goals of, of that were presented? That was for the, for the Fort River Feasibility Study Building Committee. Does the committee have any objection to that? I just want to make sure we have time. I was so encouraged when I heard these things. So the architect, I think the committee agreed on seven goals for the new um, whatever happened to Fort River. Um, one, that the building would be simple and child friendly, that it would have an age appropriate scale, that there would be na natural light and welcoming, a welcoming feel, um, multi using multifunctional space, like not always, you know, having flexible space I could use for multiple things. Um, have it, the materials and the building itself to be beautiful and durable. Um, having connections to the outdoors. And then a focus on security and safety. Thank you. Okay. So I'm feeling like the energy is sort of winding down a little bit on public comments, which is good. That means hopefully everyone that came here to say something has said something. <laughs> um, and again, I want to thank all of you for, for coming and taking the time tonight to, to say, um, to share your thoughts with the committee. It's really, really important on so many different levels. And we all appreciate uh, how busy all of you are and um, what's involved in stepping away from your normal lives to come here. Um, and speak to us. We really, really appreciate that. I think, again, uh, I want to iterate, reiterate um, something that was said earlier, which is that this whole process will be extremely important um, to make sure that we have as wide and as, you know, uh, uh, 
engaged a community as, as we can, uh, widely engaged a community as we can, um, we are definitely going to be pursuing various um, avenues to make sure that that happens. But we also have our normal avenues, which are you know emails, um, you know phones, and uh, reaching out to us, as many of you already do, um, grocery stores, et cetera. So um, I definitely want to say again, thank you for, for coming tonight. We really appreciate that. Uh, so the next item on the agenda is uh, a discussion. And I think we heard a lot tonight um, from the community, but also from Dr. Morris. Uh, that is worth talking about and considering um, a little more deeply. Um, one of the things that Dr. Morris and I had actually spoken about um, <coughs> the past week or so as we were preparing for this meeting was in, uh, you know, not just a timeline and process for gathering input and feedback, but really what the it is. And we heard that mentioned also in some of our comments tonight. Are we looking for, you know, a uh, statement of some kind at the end? Um, is there some kind of, uh, you know, petition that circulated? What does consensus actually look like in a community with so many different voices and so many different opinions? So I think those are questions that we have to try to answer. Um, if not tonight, at the very least, you know, sometime in the next few weeks, um, I think it'll be extremely valuable for the community to understand what we're working towards in order to be able to come up with uh, with something that feels like to the MSBA, hopefully, uh, like consensus. Um, so that was one thing that I think you know we wanted to definitely talk about. Uh, but I'm also just curious that you know there's uh, you know there's there's been some concerns raised about uh, making sure that we are you know we're hearing from as wide a uh, you know, group in the community as we possibly can. Uh, there's been conversations about you know focus groups and surveys and things like that. Um, and then I think also, uh, you know, what the parameters actually would look like right, for a project. Um, so that's, I think, what we wanted to put out back to the community or to the committee to, to consider. Dr. Morris, I don't know if there's anything else that you want to add um, to that before we, we dive in. I think as long as I can jump in when if I have thoughts while the discussion's happening. Yeah. So there's no formal... We didn't really think through like a formal way of, of doing this, so I'm just going to invite the committee to, to go ahead and jump in. Ms. McDonald, do you want to lead yeah, us off? Yeah, I think um, you, you raised a point that I've sort of been tossing around. We talked about it at the last the last time that we met, which is twofold: is that we, you know, one, we need to document the consensus, and then as you talked about it, we need to facilitate the consensus. So I think maybe that might be a way that we can structure our conversation tonight. Is maybe start with how, how do we want to document that and then separately, okay, how are we going to facilitate that that we can get to it? Because I think those are two related but very <coughs> different processes and on how to get to that point. And I don't have the answer, but <laughs> <laughs> but I think that but that can questions. be a good way for approaching the conversation. Because mm -hmm. um, I still struggle in it, you know, to envision what what is that going to look like? Um, and I, I've heard the suggestion of a petition and that might be a great way like put you know putting that whatever the the consensus is on a piece of paper virtual um, and and collecting the signatures of, of community members that would sign on to that but <clears throat> that's labor intensive and so may not be you know 21st century um, what the best 21st century way of, of doing that so um, you know, open to other ideas and, and ways that we can document that. Um, you know, obviously the vote of the town council and, and our own committee is, is a way um, and, and necessary. But what other ways can we can we get to demonstrating that consensus um, is, I think, a key thing before then we can start talking about sort of how we're going to get to that consensus. Yeah. <coughs> So I had, a, I had a couple of things, and one thing which I'm going <coughs> to toss out and then put aside is um, I think it would be, oh, I'd be interested in hearing whether the committee thinks it would be helpful to have some kind of a presentation from the town manager or from town hall on fi town finances and capital projects and where what we're doing fits with that. Um, just because we, I mean, as was, it was brought up just a moment ago by a member of the public, obviously, that, that this, whatever we're going to be doing around around a new new school building or buildings is going to have to fit within the town's finances, 
other projects that are going on in is literally, I guess, a department of the town. <laughs> so um, it would be, I just, I just I wonder whether that would be helpful to have something in the next couple of weeks, next few weeks, that um, would be almost more informational than anything else, not trying to help shape what the outcome is, but just give both the committee as well as the public a better understanding of where that is. On the other side of um, speaking more directly to what Ms. McDonald was just talking about, um, I feel uh, another suggestion that came from the audience around trying to reverse engineer what what does the consensus document look like? And I think going back to something Ms. McDonald said last meeting, what's also the minimum, I think viable product, but I mean in this context, what's what's the sort of minimal <laughs> minimum agreement that's also meaningful? Because the, the key the key challenge we have is that you know we might be able to get consensus on something and that would be kind of fun to do because it feels like we haven't had a lot of consensus all the time. Mm -hmm. um, but if it was consensus that was didn't speak to the MSBA's considerations and didn't really speak in a meaningful way, then um, that wasn't really a great exercise, right? And on the other hand, as was also mentioned by a member of the public, there's like a million things you could imagine trying to line up consensus on where we know they're like, you know, all of them are like third rails and we could be arguing for the next two years over them. Um, whether they're asked for in the in the submission or not, and I don't I don't know if you have any guidance on that, but I say that because it kind of it also helps shape in my mind what the sequence is of trying to get. There's a process to me of both public education, not I mean telling people what they ought to think, but literally informing them of the process, and until as many people as possible are informed. Then, it, then there's, not, there's nothing to ask them about their opinion because they're just starting to think about it. The second step is trying to gauge what, if we have a sense of what we our outcome, not the specifics of the outcome, but literally what a member of the audience said. What does that frame look like? Then, then we start to know how we frame a conversation to at least probe for a consensus. And then after you do that, then you could test whether or not there's broad support for it, right? Because you can then make a meaningful statement and test more broadly people agree with it. And um, these are just thoughts, but I'm just, so one of my questions um, for Dr. Morris, I guess, and I'm not trying to be cute about this, but I mean, are, are, we, are we at a point where you have a sense of what an end document looks like, not in its details, but even in its frame? Dr. Morris? Yeah, so, um, so I think the things that MSBA, my opinion is the things that MSBA would be looking for would be kind of the rough size of the school, uh, which we talked about earlier, and whether it's replacing one or both buildings. And, and I'm being intentional in my language because um, we've gotten a lot of emails, right, in the last couple of weeks, um, mm -hmm. and a lot of creative ideas about how, uh, let me put it differently, some people might hear those two questions and feel like there's a preordained answer that mm -hmm. like, oh, well, if you want to replace both buildings, right, then the school size has to be, you take two buildings and you combine them, right? And I think there's many different ways that one could approach that task, uh, whether you're doing one building or two. And so I think the, the options are less limiting than perhaps the perception when I say size of building and replacing one or both buildings, because there's a number <laughs> of factors at play there. So I know it sounds simplistic, but um, really there's, there's more variations than one could list here about different ways to approach that task. Does that help? Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I would, go ahead, Mr. Deming, I'll, I'll no, wait. You can, you <laughs> no, 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 go ahead, please. Okay. Um, <laughs> no, yeah, you go ahead first. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't see your hand before, no, so that's right. I just started talking before. Uh, um, I mean, I, I would think that, I, you know, this, all of us are going to have opinions, right, about the appropriate you know, size, scope, educational plan, all of that. Uh, for me, it feels like the wrong, uh, the wrong approach. I feel like the, you know, hopefully in, in everything that we do and every conversation that we have, we're, we should be thinking about what's best for the students in the district and for our educators. And I think that, you know, a lot of the, the ideas that have been put forth, both in the previous project and in this one, are trying to help us meet that, right? And they're, they're trying to, you know, as Mr. Nakajima said, I think most people have best interests of the school and, and students in mind. Um, 
That said, I think that there's also certain things that, you know, only you, Dr. Morris, or, you know, perhaps, and or perhaps other administrators and educators can provide in the sense of what it's like, what the experience is like working and living in, you know, in those buildings from day to day. Um, and that can provide some actual guidance for us, right, on what, you know, an appropriate project would be in, in the, the right parameters. Where we give guidance is basically on, you know, what the town, what we're hearing back from community, what, you know, what sort of policy we want to have in place uh, in, with regards to an educational plan, none of which we're ready to get to at this point, right? And so I guess, you know, what, I, what I'm thinking about when I'm hearing all of these, uh, you know, comments coming back from, from individual community members and even from us, uh, what I'm hearing is a need for that synthesis that you described before of coming back and, you know, and, and uh, you know, sharing with us a recommendation, right? That's something that we can then respond to and that we can, you know, uh, bounce off of. Because before that point, it's basically just us proffering more of our ideas and more opinions, and you know, it's not necessarily uh, giving any structure or shape to what you know an application would even look like, right? So even just a answering the, the basic question of you know what the rough size of the school might be. Um, you know, I think all of us would come, or many of us would come up with different ideas of what a, an appropriate size for an elementary school would be, right? Um, that doesn't necessarily make it right. And so, you know, I feel like we've seen even Fort River and, and Wildwood in and of themselves, a the physical structure of those buildings have, have experienced many different numbers of students within each one of those. Um, at this point, you know, Fort River has just over 300 students for a school that was built for close to 700 students in, you know, in its, in its prime. Um, that size of school is inappropriate for, for the number of students that are there. But I can't say, you know, that's the preferred size of a school, right? Because it's not, you know, something based on anything beyond my personal, you know, like or, or taste. Um, what I would want to hear, what would help inform that is, do we think that this is actually the appropriate size for where our students are learning? Is this, you know, the, are the spaces that are in there actually right-sized for them and right-sized for educators in the 21st century? Um, are we having challenges right now with the spaces and, you know, and, and the, do we expect that there should be any changes made both because of population but also just because of learning styles? All of which I, I know from conversations that I've had with you, the, some of those answers. But I think having that exercise happen um, during the next few weeks will be helpful for the rest of the community that may not be as deeply mired in some of this decision, the, these decisions as we are. Um, so that's just kind of where my, my thinking is at this point. I think it's, you know, it's, it's really, uh, again, very helpful to hear from you, you know, what your thinking is and your recommendations are, which I know are coming. Uh, but at this stage, you know, that's just sort of what I'm dealing with or grappling with. Mr. Dunley. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so it's interesting. So I'm, I'm trying to tie this back to your, your um, presentation from last meeting and your statements there. And, um, and, so, and so to, to re very roughly paraphrase you, you talked about, you know, what, what is you sort of like your first level, your personal priorities that you would be a dogged advocate for? And, Correct me if I'm wrong, but it was walls, um, natural light, ADA accessibility, and com and completed, meaning both buildings solved before our current kindergartners leave elementary school. So the first three, I don't think there's much debate about in the community. <laughs> and if there is, it's not cer certainly something I would not endorse. <laughs> so I think it's I think we're cool on natural light, ADA accessibility in rooms. It's that last one that I think is the is is the thing that. That is the very first step that I think just, again, in terms of time efficiency, we, it makes uh, sense to expeditiously look at directly because I think the rest of the, these questions fall after this. So this is the way I think about this, is that if, if that's truly a non-negotiable, if we truly we want both buildings solved within, um, within the next five and a half years, right, which is when our current kindergartens would graduate uh, if, if we were still K to six, um, and Further, we, we assume that the town is not going to fully fund a building, and we've had no indication that the town is going or able to do that. Uh, when I last pressed the town manager on it, he very accurately said he was not a politician, but you know his advice is that he would not doesn't think that that's a feasible thing. So we're working under the assumption that this is MSBA, right? And so if if we're working under the assumption that this is MSBA, and we want to be done in five and a half years, there's no other option than to have one physical structure. 
that, that's the constraint. So when I, when I think about constraints, I, I get concerned about going out to the community and asking all sorts of broad-based questions about how many buildings would you like and what is your preferred educational, like, and that is interesting and, and helpful and productive on a certain, um, uh, in a certain context, but in this <coughs> context, I, I feel like if those two things are true, that the MS, we have to do this MSBA and, and we are committed to being done in five and a half years, it has to be one physical structure. There, there's no other way to fund it. And I think um, all the information that you present tonight about the educational urgency and then the financial constraints, there's other financial constraints that you didn't go over, but um, we've gone, gone over them before. Um, getting people to that point and saying, this, this, this is where we're at, um, it, it then lays the foundation for the conversation about, well, then what size of school do we want to have? And, and what does that look like? Does, can, can it be co-located? Can it be different? kinds of designs. And then it gets into great configuration. I would, um, you know, I, I don't want to put carts before the horse, but I also want this thing to have teeth if it's going to actually be a consensus document, not just a happy document. Um, I, I think we're going to have to talk about just the concept of great configuration, whether or not it's, it's appropriate in this kind of a document. Um, so that, that's sort of where, where I start. I think that, that gets to some of the comments that we heard during public comment about a bit, a bit, a bit of confusion about what would help the MSBA and, and what they don't want to hear and what they do want to hear and in terms of consensus building. Um, so yeah, so that, that's, that's where I'm at. Mr. Nakajima. So let me put a finer point on my earlier comment about having the town manager or other people from town hall come in. The reason I wanted that to happen is because I think we need to have a deeper conversation about town. For knowing that the town council is going to be making a lot of decisions and I'm not trying to get the heart cart for the horse, but our committee needs to have a better understanding so I remember the comment the town manager made, um, but the bottom line is, I, I hate to call it an off-the-cuff comment, but essentially an off-the-cuff response in a meeting about the feasibility of, of funding, self-funding a school isn't really thorough enough due diligence for us or for the community to hear. So that was, that was so my point is what you're raising, Mr. Demling, is exactly why I wanted the, um, the committee to see if we could invite in the town manager and others, the finance director, to come in and speak and provide some more greater information and context for the community discussion around financing. So I think I think it'd be helpful for all of us, particularly, and that's not funny about this, particularly if the outcome is that it is less likely or less feasible that we could even consider self-funding, then you're right. It puts more of a fine point on what are we really looking at. Um, and then I, I think that the, um, I mean, we had a lot of conversation about this last meeting. Um, Around, around the question of what does it mean to fix both schools in a, a short period of time. Um, I actually think that part of the, not to read into it too much, but part of the comment the superintendent made a moment ago was that um, sometimes all of our creativity or awareness around what's the best, what's the optimal combination between facility design, infrastructure, in the optimal learning environment for kids is overly predetermined. It's either predetermined by the experience, if you're a parent, experience of your kids, or your own experience, or what you read in Time Magazine once, right? And I'm not trying to be sarcastic about this, but I'm just saying we walk in with these cognitive lenses mm -hmm. that are really strong and powerful about what we think works in a school that may or may not be borne out by the evidence, but also um, may not be borne out by the relative shades of gray between different different scenarios, almost all of which involve some level of a trade-off between how much money you have, how much space you have to build uh, a building, um, how much time you have, uh, and all these <coughs> kind of constraints you have, right? There's always gonna be trade-offs in what you do with your facilities, and those trade-offs are gonna have impacts that some people in the community and members of school committees are gonna have really strong opinions about. That's why being guided by the best research and best educational practice is important but also I think something that the superintendent was hinting at earlier, not be overdetermined with the idea that the only scenario is one scenario. And I don't, and forgive me, I don't mean, this is actually not a comment about whether it means one building, but if it means, let's say, one campus, or one area, or one complex, are there different ways those things are designed? Are there different ways those things are laid out? Are there different ways of doing shared services that can still create a good scaled environment for kids? My guess is probably, but, my, but I would like to, I'd like to know more about that because I think part of the problem I have, and it's also part of the problem I have with the idea 
of, of, let's say for sake of argument, we decided tomorrow to do a survey, I don't have any idea what those questions would be, how they'd be framed out, or how we'd even understand the answers. Because if we said to people right now, uh, would you prefer two smaller schools over one larger one, they're gonna put all sorts of freight into what that question means to them. Then if you also said, would you like two smaller schools or one larger one, but you can get the second one 15 years from now, and I'm making that up, but I'm just saying if you said that, you might get a different answer from people, right? And so, so not only does that document become highly politicized, but potentially politicized, but the more anodyne it is, the more sort of boring on paper it is and like watching paint dry, probably the less meaningful the answers you're going to get out of it because the reality is a lot of what you're talking about is fairly dynamic. And also there's, there's more than one way you can design these things. And so what I'd love to do if we're going to come to, uh, if we're going to try to approach consensus on some things, what I'd love to do is think about when you're, when you're doing these facilitated sessions or even in advance of them, how do we improve the quality? And I don't mean like, I'm not, this is not a statement that any debate has been bad right. or uninformed. What I'm saying is what we do is we sort of have a do no harm attitude that instead of further messing up the town's debate on this subject, we leave it better than we found it, right? <laughs> and we actually have, we have even better information around, around what this could look like. Uh, because I think if we do that, it's also more likely we're gonna be able to get um, some, hopefully you can move on towards some consensus. I, I agree with what Mr. Dumbling was saying a moment ago, is that I'm also, um, I, 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 it's an interesting challenge. On the one hand, I am genuinely curious to see what consensus we can arrive at, and that can only occur with open listening and open and active engagement, which is not overly freighted with our expectations. And, I, and you have to mean it in order for it to happen. On the flip side of it, I also think it's really important to not mislead anyone about what would it look like to actually have the problem solved in, in five years or five and a half years. If there's an answer to that, and the answer is plural, not singular, it's still probably a bounded set of alternatives, right? It's not like, you know what I mean? It's not all things to all people. That's a lot. Hopefully that added something to the conversation. I'm not sure it did. Ms. McDonald. Yeah. Um, <coughs> sort of building on things that each of you have, have said, um, I do think, um, so I love the, the suggestion of the listening sessions. I'm not sure I think that that's enough. Um, sort of, and, and I don't know the answer. I, you know, there's a lot I want to say, but sort of staying on this idea of open listening versus frameworks versus one of the things, given our timeline, I don't think that we have the luxury of having completely un sort of bordered or bounded open listening sessions and conversations. I think we really need to get to a point that we're showing some options. And I think sort of a lot of thoughts swirling my head. I mean, you mentioned people come into these things and you know, if you say either this or that, it's going to be the evaluation of that is going to be based on their own experiences or, or their things that they've heard, right? And we won't know that, and that's not going to be useful for us. But it's <coughs> it's also we need to. <coughs> it, it, it's not an in, you know we don't have unlimited funds, we don't have unlimited time. Um, whether whether we adhere to our goal of getting the current kindergartners into new learning environments by sixth grade, or just before the buildings literally fall apart and, and fall down, you know that's that, you know that detail is meaningless. We need to do something. So it, it's not like I can eat all the ice cream I want, and there's no you know there's it's going to cost me something. It's going to have impacts on other things in in my life. Right? So I think we need to spell out what that. It's a mathematical thing where you do, you know you draw the lines and you see this is the area in which I can make a decision. And I think sort of mapping out that the decision parameters that we need to be making um, and some of the options. And I, you know, reading all of the letters and emails that we've gotten over the last couple of weeks, I agree that there's, you know, just to say we're gonna address both buildings in, in one project does not necessarily mean it's gonna be one building with 700 students. There's so many other creative ways that we can ad address this. And I think <coughs> focusing our community discussions on 
eliciting some of those ideas and getting that consensus. And I think that can help people come to this, this that proposal with more than just, oh, well, you, if you say it's going to be both, you, we're going to address both buildings, that's only one solution. I think that's, we're never going to get there. And I think by bounding that conversation that way, we can get to sort of more of the nuances within that conversation. I think also on the listening sessions, and I don't know if we want to go right now into that or if we want to stay in this sort of the same space. I'm not going to let I think either way is fine, yeah. Right. So on the listening sessions, I do think, again, given the timeline that we're looking at um, and the importance of that, and as well as all of the well, you know, the, the strong and well-founded opinions and ideas and suggestions and, and conversations coming from the community, we really need to have skilled and professional facilitation, I think, for that, in addition to coming at it with a framework and actually looking to get reaction as opposed to just open-ended um, feedback. Um, so that's, that's my one thought on that. And, and probably even, not just the facilitation, but developing the framework and the prompts, like having some professional support on that, as well as synthesizing those learnings into what are the themes. Um, so having, you know, all sides and as many community members present to hear that, um, including ourselves, is important. But I think <coughs> the facilitation and the synthesis, we need to have some of that professional support so that it, it, we're ensuring that we're getting the most out of it. Um, so whether that's a task force that's pulled, pulled together of, of small task force that, with experts or that we actually look to work with somebody that can um, uh, support us in that. And I do think, um, I, mean, I, I hear the many requests for surveys, and, and I know that that was my first knee-jerk, my knee-jerk, oh, we need to do a survey, and I think surveys get a bad rap, um, coming from my background in product management and, <laughs> and, and the like, where we do a lot of surveys, but it, it's, it, the one thing is you, you can't rely on just one mode for collecting input, and I do think, and, and I don't buy into this idea that we can't measure community sentiment, you can if, if, you know, it might be difficult in the time frame that we have, but I, I do think that we can get a good handle on it, and I do um, agree with the concern that we need to make sure that we're getting that broad, broad input. And I worry, um, like some of the people who have spoken tonight, that by focus, using these listening sessions as our sole means of getting that input is going to limit the kind of input that we get. So. Not sure, you know, there's creative ways that you can build a survey so that it's sort of decision choice matrices or, you know, um, sort of the either or and you present sort of trade, you know, trade off analyses. That's probably getting way more complicated and expensive than what we want to do. So I, I, won't, I won't recommend that. But, you know, are there other ways that we can address the different ways that people are comfortable and able to give us feedback on some of our reactions? And one thought that I just had, you know, is it a public folder? or discussion board or, or, or chat area where we're collecting the letters and sharing <coughs> them back also so that the rest of the community can benefit from the, the comments and ideas that we're getting um, in our inboxes or our conversations, statements from the public that for the public consumption are ways that people can read what other people are saying and contribute to the conversation that way in a way that isn't sort of in the newspaper or standing and coming to a listening at a school committee meeting or something like that. And I, I don't, those are just, this is just one idea. I'm sure there's others, but I do think that we need to spend the time to think of other ways beyond the listening sessions that we're getting additional documented and shared input from others. So. Thank you. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Morris, uh, just a question. Do you happen to know off the top of your head what the response rate was for the last survey that we, that was done for the building project? Don't. I apologize. Do you have a rough sense? I'm sorry. I really. Okay. That's fine. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No. It's. Um, <coughs> I raised the question yeah. because I, I, if I remember correctly, yeah. you know, it, I remember seeing that and uh, thinking to myself, you know, it was it was a decent response rate, but not, not as high of a number as you would hope, right? For you know, several thousand people that are potential voters on any given topic or issue. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, I think for, for in terms of engagement, I, I would agree with Ms. McDonald about not relying on only one form of solicitation, right? So I think, you know, listening sessions are useful because 
They um, allow you to kind of dig under the surface, so not two-dimensional the way that surveys tend to be. Um, you know, you release a survey out there and you can only fit so many questions on a piece of paper or an online form before people lose interest and don't fill them out. I've gone through that a million times. I know a lot of other people that do as well. Um, and you can't understand necessarily, even with a comment section, to what degree people really care about something or don't care about something, right? Or, you know, when you're making decisions about something that might affect policy or that might affect something like a building, uh, it's difficult to gauge how deeply people are informed about it and how much they, they really care or know about <coughs> something. So, you know, those are my concerns with, with surveys going out. I feel that uh, listening sessions were, you know, even better. If we had all the time in the world, we probably would have some sort of focus groups, you know, and, and uh, facilitated focus groups of some kind. There was a public commenter who mentioned IDEO before. That, or I've worked with them before. It's a design thinking firm. Um, they're wonderful extremely expensive, very much in high demand, you know, around the world. And I don't have no, you know, uh, I have aspirations, I guess, that they would, you know, potentially want to work on this particular project, but, you know, I won't uh, pursue that because I don't think that that would actually be very reasonable for, for this project. However, I do think that facilitating some kind of, I think you called it facilitating consensus, is extremely important, right? Having some kind of, you know, opportunity to, uh, gauge where people are to ask pointed questions to you know have that back and forth might be useful um, so you know I, the problem I think for us is budget and time right because those ten kinds of things are expensive you bring in contractors from outside to do that work um, you know they tend to to cost money uh, money which we don't really have and I think also that the timeline you know means that we would be trying to hire contractors to come in and do this kind of work um, and try to schedule these, you know, facilitated conversations, which may also prove very challenging. I'm not saying we shouldn't do it, but it's just something that, that is in the back of my mind. So to me, that means, you know, uh, surveys less desirable, but maybe a combination of things where it's, you know, some, uh, you know, survey going out to gauge more or less general people's education or knowledge of where we are in the process, provide some general feedback and then maybe some additional focus groups or something that allow us to get some more pointed information you know, from folks and allows us to ask some of the deeper questions. And I think it would look very much like the listening sessions that you outlined, uh, Dr. Morris, already, because we're looking at educators, we're looking at the you know, parents and, and uh, caregivers, and we're looking at just general community, right? It also provides, I think, an opportunity for our town council to provide some, some leadership in this, which they've expressed an interest in already. We've received a couple of different emails from town council members uh, expressing an interest in, you know, bringing these discussions to their districts, having, you know, conversations. Um, you know, I think it, that's, that would be a great way to engage the community. I, I would want to make sure that everybody's hearing the same thing and that they're, you know, so if we were to pursue something like that, we'd want to make sure that, you know, we have decided already what the it is that we're trying to get yeah. to before releasing that out in the wild. Um, but again, I think a great opportunity for some engagement in different circles that we don't necessarily always, you know, have uh, input from. Um, finally, I would say I think the, uh, you know, the, the town finances. I was wondering if the presentation that was made at the four boards meeting um, by the town manager provides enough information. I, rec I realized that that was before the town council came into, you know, uh, were seated. Um, but I'm wondering if that provides at least enough financial information about where we, the town currently is. I wouldn't imagine that much has changed in the past four months. Um, that then allows us to kind of take it to that next level, as Mr. Nakajima mentioned, of just understanding, you know, where we are. Maybe it's, you know, that presentation plus some additional uh, data that may have come in, or I don't know if the Finance Committee or anyone else has, has you know, given any further thought to where what our town finances look like, but in any case, I just, you know, I'm trying to think of just in terms of timing yeah. and what's feasible if that might be a way to get to what you were saying you wanted, mm -hmm. um, and that I think would probably be helpful for, for all of us, right? I also just wanted to bring up, uh, so Ms. Spitzer, I had mentioned this at the start of the meeting, Ms. Spitzer had shared some, some thinking with, with me. Um, prior knowing that she wasn't going to be here. And one of the things that she had said was actually very similar to what we've been talking about was, you know, uh, we want to be able to agree <coughs> on a timeline and a means of engaging the stakeholders, which is what we're kind of grappling with right now. Um, 
but one thing that, that she suggested is you know, that maybe we just want to be able to uh, include in the application that there is a process in place for soliciting input and maybe, you know, not sure if that's enough, but if we don't get to a point where we have complete consensus, whatever that looks like in the community, if maybe it's enough for the MSBA to understand that we have a plan in place for getting that, right? I don't know. Um, I think that was just something that she wanted to share. Um, and then I think she, she also mentioned, you know, sort of parameters. Um, so obviously she hasn't been privy to this conversation, but it sounds like I think a lot of, you know, all of us are pretty much in the same place of sort of establishing some general guidelines. And finally, I just wanted to say, I think the, um, you know, that I also appreciate having some general guidelines, um, and it, that goes back to my point, my earlier point to you, Dr. Morris, about coming back with some recommendations, because I think that that is a great place to start, in addition to the finances, but also to town finances and, and feasibility of any project, uh, but also just understanding, you know, what, uh, what your recommendations might be for, for moving forward, extremely helpful in my mind um, for how we can make a decision around this. Mr. Nakajima. Yeah, and let me, let me, I, 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 you've just been given a million things to respond to, so <laughs> uh, So, so a million and one, a million and one. Uh, and I, and I, I'm just gonna put a, I, wanna, I wanted to put a fine point on the very last thing that the chair just said is, um, I, have, I have heard you say, and we have talked, that um, you think that, that based on research, not you think, like you're just sitting around eating ice cream and staring at the sun, um, but based on your experience and your, your uh, expertise, um, that an optimal uh, learning community or learning environment, um, school environment, uh, is around you know, 300, 350 students or something like that. And I've, I've heard you make that comment more than once, particularly recently. Um, what's, so it would be probably, and this goes to the point about, lit, about a, couple, a couple things. I mean, one, framing out where we think we are in this process in the town. Two, um, understanding where this process is in terms of the MSBA. Like where we are in town and what we're doing. Where are we in terms of trying to get consensus? What does that consensus mean? Does it mean trying to solve both buildings in a short period of time? whatever pressure that puts on. The most interesting one for me is actually not that. Because, I mean, those are, those are sort of mechanical pressures that are on us. We know we don't have all the money in the world. Um, I think there is probably already consensus that the buildings stink and need to be substantially overhauled or replaced. And there's probably not actually a lot of disagreement on that. And that even that there's some urgency around doing that. I'm not even sure there's any disagreement on that. Um, so then the nub of it comes back to this question of, what are, what are the core educational principles that we actually think are critical that we support as a school district? And then what facilities correspond or can or, and, or what kinds of facilities, because it may not be singular, it may be plural, what kinds of facilities um, can match those learning objectives? And then I'm gonna throw in a third one just because I feel like it, is that when you're dealing with buildings that are gonna be around for 50 years, what decisions do you need to make now around educational program, and ones what ones are actually not necessary to make, um, because the building itself may in fact go through many lives over forty or fifty years, and needs to be flexible enough to be able to adapt to them. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, do you want to walk out now? Or? <laughs> not at all. You have thirty seconds to respond to all of it. <laughs> I'll get the timer back up. Um, so. I want to start from the place actually going back, Mr. Demling brought up uh, a comment I made last week about kindergarten and sixth grade and, and actually a piece of feedback I received since that meeting in December, uh, which is interesting. It, it doesn't change the timeline or it doesn't change my thinking, but it was just a different way to put it. And it wasn't my comment, but I, I think it resonated with me is, um, you know, those kids that's talking about like one year. So that's like a, a very aspirational thing that we think about our youngest students now. What I should have been thinking about was babies being born in 2019 and do they ever go into an open classroom, right? Because that's like their whole elementary school experience. So, you know, uh, ironically, I heard that after there was a baby at our last meeting. So, you know, it was, it was sort of resonated with me and perhaps that person watched it on Amherst Media and saw me talking and said, what the heck are you talking about? Like, look 12 feet over, right? Um, so I think it doesn't change the sense. I say that because I think it's about the urgency. 
right? And so I agree with you know some of the comments, you know, particularly Ms. Fay, who I speak with frequently about the urgency um, that we're facing right now. Um, so I just want to restate that that it it it, it was. I think for me, I have to start from an aspirational place of what's the best I can do to advocate for the kids that are in the district now and are coming to the district, right? Like that's my job. I should be, that should be routinely things that I do. Whether that happens or not is obviously a much larger conversation, but um, that's, I feel really strongly about that. Um, I think on the consensus point, just I wanted to back up and, and share some thoughts. I had a consensus. So um, I'm going to make a, a statement that's not fact, but it's just my opinion, but I, I think it's likely the case that even in the best case scenario here where we brought, get broad consensus, we file with the MSBA, we feel really the community comes together, that we're not going to get to agreement on what the best possible configuration is, what the best possible school size is, what the you know, like those things. Uh, I think there's going to be a diversity of opinions, and I don't believe that we can get to a place where everyone at the end of the day agrees that their personal favorite opinion is the one that happens. Like, I think that's a false, not that anyone said that, but I want to lower our, my uh, expectation because I, I think that's a false expectation. I think there's, there's certainly people, we heard it tonight in the audience, who have really strong feelings about school size one way or the other. They have really strong feelings about co-location one way or the other, right? So for me, it's how do we find something that can move the community forward um, how do we find the hill that everyone can coexist on and move together and uh, and be, build consensus on that hill? Uh, there's a bunch of hills that people aren't willing to build consensus on, and, and for me, I'm trying to figure out, can my sense is the urgency, uh, and I can be a little flexible on you know some of the other pieces uh, because I feel like we have buildings that are not functioning as they should. We have <coughs> students who are being educated, and their education um, would be substantially different if their environment was different. And so that's where my focus is. I'm not willing to let go of everything. That's not what I'm saying. But I'm trying to model that what I think is perhaps the optimum is, is important, but it's not the only thing in the conversation. And hopefully people in the community can meet me halfway to understand that they may feel really strongly on one certain aspect of this. Um, but how do we find that place where we can move forward together? You know, so that that's really what I want, because I agree with the points multiple people have made. Everyone wants what's best for kids. There's no disagreement, there's no argument that people who are spending time on a Monday night to come to a school committee meeting and share pause, even if they intensely disagree with the other people's thoughts, they're doing because they care about the kids, right? And that that's, I think, really clear. Um, so when we think about consensus, for me, it's not um, my first choice option or someone else's first choice option is, can we agree on some foundational principles and then find a way to move forward where the vast majority of people can say either, that makes logical sense, that's perfect, or, you know, in a perfect world, I might choose this, uh, but you know what, for the good of the order, these are things that I can understand and, and, and gladly move forward with. Um, so I think that's the consensus building that, that I personally am looking for, is not convincing people about the last project or future project, right? None of that is in my thinking at all. It's how do we actually find that hill, right? And so that's what I'm constantly thinking about uh, as I go through this. I think the challenge in finding that hill is the number of unknowns in some ways is larger or greater than the number of knowns, right? So we think about the unknowns. What's the capital needs eight years from now? You know, if we still have one, of, one or both of these buildings. That's really hard to script out, right? Some things like roofs and HVAC and all that we'll know. Um, but at the, you know, when some of the schools are 58 years old, um, <coughs> what's going to happen to some of the electrical, right? There's so many unknowns uh, in that equation that it makes it hard to project out those things. How quickly we get into MSBA, you know, whoever, you know, people who look at data and there's people who disagree on that, I think the thing that everyone agrees is there's a range, right? No one knows if, even if we get, everything goes well, to, to the chair's point earlier, if we're going to get in this year or not. There's no certainty in that. We can guess, we can believe, but you know, MSBA, because I asked that question, because I'm that guy who asked those questions, right? Um, they're not willing to, to share that. And the thing they continue to say on the right is every year is a new year. So even if you were second, like the first runner up, not that we were, but some district that is the first runner up, that if some other district like decided we're imploding, we're not even going to go through this process, who would they go to? That does not guarantee that the following year <coughs> would be 
in right away. It's not a queue that you wait your turn and you just logically get in. And they're in, incredibly clear on that topic. So I think one of the things that when we're projecting these things out, the number, again, the number of unknowns is hard. And I think something that I think Mr. Denling said last time, but I could be wrong, um, is that this is really expensive, right? So for, even for the most ardent supporters of the schools, the most cost-effective plan that one could come up with has a sticker shock for some folks that are gonna say, uh, you know, couldn't we do this differently? Couldn't we, you know, figure out a different way? That's, that's going to happen as a reality of projects. Cost escalation is real. The longer we wait, the more expensive things get. The per square foot cost is gonna be more five years from now than it was five years <coughs> ago. Um, and, and so that's a reality. It's not like gas, right, which is more variable. Like, this only goes in one direction unless, as Mr. Nakajima predicted, not predicted, but, Stated, sorry, <laughs> other people are starting to predict um, that we have some economic meltdown and, and things change. But the, you know, if you look at the history of the MSBA, projects only go one direction in terms of the cost. So, um, you know, how much things are going to cost eight, nine years from now, we can project out. But there's, you know, if we assume standard escalation, it's going to be significantly more. You know, even five years from now, if you compound the interest of four percent, you're at twenty-two percent. That's a lot when you're talking about millions and millions of dollars. So, it. That's even just, I'm pointing this out not because I have an answer, it's actually to raise the point of the number of unknowns that makes it a really challenging thing to talk about. I agree with the, Mr. Bachelman, and I'll talk to him. I think the four boards meeting actually captured, I think, a lot of what might be helpful. Um, and he's, we talk all the time about this, including today, and he, I, I don't want to speak for him, but I'll be both so bold to say he'd be happy to come and, and share his perspective on things. Um, as to listening sessions, right, I'm happy to be a large part of the facilitation or not. I don't have, a, I just want to put it out there. I felt no affront. Some people are being cautious, none at all. Um, and whatever the committee decides is best for the process, I'm happy to be heavily involved, not heavily involved. And, and uh, I can see the pros and cons of that. I think that's a real discussion that you all uh, need to have. Um, and I'm not probably going to proffer an opinion on that, but I do think um, it'd be good to leave tonight with a sense of, direction on that just because of the timeline. And I think perhaps the last thing I'll comment this go round, you know, as it goes to Mr. Nakajima's comments about learning environment and size and educational programming. So when I came to Fort River in 2001, it was, you know, between, five, it was, I think a bit over 550 students. Um, I think it was a school that worked well for children. Um, the prin then principal wanted to see if he could break it up into sort of school within a school, or he didn't frame it that way, and sort of for a lot of reasons it didn't happen. And uh, <coughs> for me, it's really, when I think about it, it's the cohort size. So, you know, when we think about number of students who then get mixed into classrooms year after year, right? So um, that really matters for the student experience. It really matters for the teacher experience. So I think there are different ways, you know, there's a the size of the building, and then there's a the size of the experience that students and teachers have, and those can be two very different things. Um, so I do think there's a significant amount of research to suggest, you know, it's a little higher than, than those numbers, but between four and 500 um, seem to work very well uh, for kids knowing each other, kids knowing teachers. Um, I think we can, my personal opinion is that a building that's larger than 400, 450 students can still work effectively, and there are creative ways, some of which we got from the public, some of which, you know, I and I know many of you have spent some countless hours thinking about in our own heads. Uh, to make that work, but um, yeah, I think that's probably as far as I, you know, without starting getting to more specific ideas unless the committee wants me to, um, I would say um, about that particular question. And you had one about education and programming, and then I lost that, my notes on that. I'm sorry. <coughs> I, um, well, I had two points. I mean, yeah. one was, was sort of building off of what the chair had said. Her comment had been making that at some point we presumed we'd need some sort of recommendations or framing from you that that would be educationally sound and yeah. based. That could be that could provide the basis of how we'd approach some of this public outreach and facilitation so that it's literally not boundless. But also more importantly, and I don't mean this in a denigrating way yeah. at all or condescending, but rather than having well intended spectrum of the community who have varying degrees of expertise in education, um, we would short circuit that by relying upon actual pro educational professionals yeah. <laughs> to provide us, to, to guide us on that. The point I had been making 
around school building size and the right size of learning communities or cohorts, more had to do with the notion that there isn't a single shot solution. That when if somebody in their mind has the idea that um, they value a certain in intimacy of scale, either of the classroom experience, the broader community and cohort, whatever, that there's that my assumption was, and I thought I'd heard this from you, yeah. that there's more than one way you can organize that that's still educationally effective, which means you can actually split the conversation about whether there's a shared commitment and agreement over certain values of the educational experience that children and families are having. And you, you can effectively not completely divorce it from the question of what the facility looks like, but that it'll, you could look at a range of alternatives for building management and organization and design and even having that conversation creates a different dynamic than the one we've been in that seemed to act as if you, if you want a larger single building or complex, that means you're theoretically or conceptually opposed to the value of optimizing the learning environment for those children. Right. That's on the one hand. The other side of it was, and this is really not, nothing you've said, is me in interjecting my own opinion. <laughs> That if you're that if you felt if you felt two things were really true, that you were building a building in 50 years, and that you really wanted or buildings whatever, and you wanted to do it as soon as possible because it's really urgent to do so, that um, you recognize that goodness knows what, what the demographic or educational needs of the district would look like in 35 years. So rather than overly my this is again my opinion rather than overly worrying and freighting the facility with very specific educational programming overlays, it would be interesting to know what do we need to decide to decide that we're going to have a facility and what do we not need to decide, partially because you'd want the building to be flexible over time anyway for future considerations of school committees or whatever, public needs, whatever. I don't know if you had any opinion on those, again, minor questions. <laughs> yeah, no, I think your second point spot on that, that um, we know that you know having an agile environment for for the building is going to be important because we can guarantee that 35 years <coughs> from now, whether it's demographics, well, that'll certainly be different just because it'd be weird if it stayed the same, right? Um, for 35 years, um, but learning modalities, right? But what we know is that. Research indicates that acoustic privacy is really important. The fact that you can hear the teacher and the teacher can hear you and there's not other noise that's going on, right? That's not going to go out of fashion. or out of, It's not a fad, right? Um, it's, that was known a long time ago and then some people for about 15 years messed it up and then it got right back where it needed to be. Um, I do think there's other things about building design that we want to make it it's going to sound, this has a negative connotation, but as, you know, as much standard as we can. Standard being to not build and lock ourselves into a particular um, design that 10 years from now be like, oh, we're not doing that anymore, and sort of, that's unfortunate we built it that way, right? So having that agility uh, as part of the building design, I think, seems crucial, because you're right, lots of things will change, but the core pieces of needing light and uh, needing acoustic privacy and having accessibility, right? I feel like those are pretty universal things, and if we can focus on those, as there were multiple public comments about, uh, and less on the other pieces, we'll all be in a better place. So I'm going to go out on a limb here, yeah. <laughs> um, and just in you know, in the interest of time and trying to move this conversation, and also trying to answer your question, which I think is a good one about you know, um, sort of direction about you know, survey versus. Uh, focus groups or whatever we want to call them, community forums. Um, so I think that it would be helpful if we were to do a couple things. One is to start um, kind of wheeling down those things that we understand, I think, universally that a lot of people have been talking about already. And all of us could probably rattle those off. We already have been doing that, more or less. You know, natural light being one of them, real classrooms being another, et cetera, et cetera. Um, something, an effort to put things to paper that basically give us a very sketched out outline for what a community will support, right? Um, sounds very basic, but I think it's great to just start from there. And then I think it would be really helpful for us 
to have perhaps even at our meeting on the 22nd a little bit more information about um, both the previous survey that was done and response rate, but also I think just, uh, you know, if, if we were to pursue some sort of general uh, communication, um, if there are specific questions that we want to have answered with something like that, right? So it's not just about, you know, can we, um, I'm not even going to pretend to make that up, but I think it's, you know, you get my point, right? Mm -hmm. it's, I think we want to, there, there are a couple of questions that are kind of hanging out there that some folks may feel we need to answer, and I think that might be useful actually for the listening sessions as well. Mm -hmm. um, but I, it would be really helpful for me anyway to hear, you know, what we, what, what that end product might look like with something like that, you mm -hmm. know? Um, I think it also would be really helpful for us to just start scheduling sessions, right? I mean, it seems like most, like everyone here has already, at least in principle, agreed to this idea of having listening sessions. Um, those are quickly going to run into <laughs> a scheduling problem if we don't start doing that now. So I think it would be really helpful to just begin scheduling them and then to think through, you know, if there's additional, um, you know, uh, facilitation or something like that that requires a, you know, additional conversation with the committee, maybe we could have that also in our meeting on the 22nd. Um, at this point, it sounds like you feel like you've kind of got it more or less under control just in terms of, of holding the sessions, right? Yeah. Um, well, I'm sorry, I didn't know if that was a rhetorical question. Yeah. <laughs> it's not uh, a rhetorical question, yeah. yeah. I mean, I'm comfortable with that. I'm comfortable co-facilitating. I mean, I, I do... I meant what I said on that slide that um, I do think it'd feel different if we had, you know, even if I'm the primary facilitator or whatever because of my role that we have multiple facilitators um, and then, you know, that the other facilitators were people who are publicly as well as, I mean, not that they didn't really disagree but also seen as perhaps being uh, individuals who publicly disagreed with each other, you know, in the past about their prior building project to kind of but not just a symbolic note, but also if we're trying to build consensus, we have to see where our communities are to, to work with me. That being said, if the committee wants to kind of approach for external facilitation who, um, again, has, you know, training in facilitation and uh, comes into it fresh and not with any um, preconceived connection to a prior project, I can see that being effective as well. I'm really open to what the committee, the direction the committee wants to have. So um, very briefly <coughs> on this, one, I like the idea of doing the sessions. If it's nine sessions, that's great. Um, I figure we'll handle the question of other modes of out. I mean, if we can segment it and say, yeah. if we know we want yeah. to do sessions, let's do sessions. Let's deal with what other modes of exactly. outreach we want to do. Um, I thought the audiences you have are generally good. Uh, I, think you, you, I think you need to be a principal speaker. I actually think we should have professional facilitator if, if it's feasible to do so with budget and everything mm -hmm. um, partially but also because of something as McDonald said earlier mm -hmm. that usually if you have a good facilitator they're also responsible for coming up with a professionally synthesized document that then takes those learnings and put them forward mm -hmm. in a way that people get a confidence was done professionally yeah. I'm gonna there's a lot of negative ways of framing it like wasn't biased wasn't arbitrary mm -hmm. wasn't only half listening but more importantly you hired someone to do something they do this for a living right. they're gonna come back with something that could be then be a transparent deliverable um, I do <coughs> think trying to find ways to make sure we invite people who are prominent on different sides of the previous projects a good idea I think we should try to I, th I actually think it would be important I'm gonna set aside town council and what it does, because obviously it's their own decision what they choose to do. Um, I think it's important that members of the school committee, even if we leave the number low enough that it doesn't trigger a quorum, I think school committee members should go to every single session. Because I don't, I mean, this is, I, I think this is unintentional on your slides, but I really, I'm going to say this bluntly, I really dislike the idea of us maybe accidentally not going to the sessions, <laughs> or not all of them, and then like in February 26th, you come back with a memo about a, a series of events that maybe we only half went to, and it's like, that that sounds messed up. Yeah. If we're involved deeply in the decision making, <laughs> we, you know, and, and I recognize with nine sessions, it could be impossible, even if we called a meeting of, to make it official or we promised not to say anything, um, we probably can't all five go to all nine sessions, 
but we probably could schedule it in a way to try to make sure that at least one member or two members went to every session. And I actually think that's important because also in the end, whatever consensus we're driving has to be, and I, I actually, I, this is going to sound stupid because I talk so much. Part of what I love about that is I actually love the idea of us going to a session and not saying a word for two hours and just sitting and absorbing and writing notes and taking in the scene. I think that would be an awesome thing. Mr. Dumbling. So, yeah, I like all of Mr. Nakajima's suggestions. Um, I, again, I think the logistical uh, acquisition challenge is probably the biggest hurdle for getting a professional facilitator. Yeah. And, and uh, so, you know, do what we can do with the time timeline we have. Um, I, I do like the idea of having, you know, on the dais, a, a rep from the pro and, and um, not supporting side from the, the past. I'm just because, I mean, that is the context that we're living in. I mean, I. I think it's been really, really encouraging, uh, at least in my personal conversations, and I'm, I'm guessing with other committee members as well, that um, you know, the conversations I've had with, with people who have engaged on this project, that there is really a, a, um, a letting go of the past arguments, I've, I've, I've felt. I mean, people obviously feel, st feel strongly, um, but the idea that this is, this is a fundamentally different thing, right? This isn't, we're going to have a vote, and so brace up your weapons and fight to the death, and if you get 50 point X percent, then you win. This is actually consensus building, and even if you battled and destroyed the other side, you know, that, that's a pyrrhic victory, because it's not going to demonstrate what we need to get the statement of interest. So I, I, think, I think having that, if, if it's not too crowded, you know, with, with you and facilitator, if, if available, and a couple people, that would, that would be great. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm continually, continuing to try and, um, solve this this bounding problem right <coughs> um, and so you know I'm, I'm sure that you know as part of this you know you, you'll do some sort of condensed version of what you just did here but here here are all the constraints that were that we're at um, but there's you know there's these other constraints I'm coming back to that are really like non-negotiables and I, I mean I have thought of us constructing a vision statement that would be like when we I'm sort of skipping around here but if we think of like the end product as a statement a piece of paper one-page statement that is stapled to the statement of interest. Um, the first statement <coughs> could, could be a vision statement from, from us, um, school committee and superintendent, that, that we construct, um, that, that outlines those, those high-level values and, and those, that core thing that is, that is truly not negotiable. Because I, I can't imagine um, this consensus exercise working without the school committee superintendent being on board with it. I mean, I know that sounds absurd to say, but, um, but we, we really do. And so what are really the things that we absolutely cannot move off of? And so if, if we've already said the easy ones, the rooms, the walls, the light, the ADA compliance, um, you, know, you know, the high quality learning environment, it's really just a wordsmith sentence of that, plus our, some form of our current kindergartners leaving elementary school, um, with not in open space classrooms, I think is, is the articulation. Um, I mean, it's probably a little late to, to draft up and vote something like that, um, but I think at least to bound what that is. Because, you know, it's, it's, it's a funny thing, um, and, and it's really the timeline that's forcing us to do this <laughs> so, so, so condensed. I, I don't want to put the cart before the horse and say, well, this is what the school committee thinks, and we don't care about what the public thinks. That's, that's not, it's not the case. I don't want to give that impression. Um, but, but I also want to honor the urgency that we've paid attention to this at such a deep level, and so is the community and the people we've heard from, that this, this, we're not starting from scratch. Um, and, um, and, you know, just personally speaking, I, I, don't, I would not be okay with a solution that, that took longer than five or six years and that went, you know, a decade plus potentially. It's, it's just not okay by, by, by me. That's just me, that's just me speaking. Um, so, so I, I think some combination of, of sort of like that vision <coughs> statement that, that puts that last sort of bound <coughs> parameter in, um, supplemented, you know, by the, the town coming, us, coming to us and telling us what the actual financial limitations they have are, um, with, with the rest of the, those, those bounded limitations um, is, is a good frame to, to then ask the community, okay, then here's the two or three big picture issues we want to hear back on. What are your, what are your thoughts? So I totally endorse that. And I think, um, you know, just like, you know, thinking through focus group sessions, sort of, it's, it's like putting the vision statement out there. It's not to say this is what we think and, you know, <laughs> yes or no. It's really something that is 
a little bit more concrete than mm -hmm. what do we want mm -hmm. um, for community members to be able to read, understand, and react to. And then we can go point by point. Like, what are the what are the concerns with this point? What are the concerns, you know? And, and as you say, pretty much knock off the first three because everybody generally agrees to them and to really focus in and hone in on the places where there are many more perspectives. It's, you know, we always say that it's like much easier to edit than it is to create, right? So giving, uh, for these sessions, having something that people can react to, respond to, and edit versus um, versus a complete blank slate to create what that vision is, I think would be really important to making those super productive. Um, and if there's sort of, and again, not cart before the horse or defining what we, you know, this is what the school committee is saying, what it should be, but, you know, storytelling is really um, empowering for to, to get that reaction. And so, you know, I was inspired by reading some of the letters because they were, they were approaches that I hadn't ever thought of. And I think, you know, we come, you know, most of us in the community that have been here through that previous, previous building discussion, we're limited in, in sort of knowing what that option was and then what we have today. And it's very difficult for us to sort of see beyond what could be some of the other options. And I think, and again, you know, what are some of the parameters without defining a solution, but saying, you know, here are different ways that we could address all students you know, with one new building, right? And sort of, you know, spelling out, like, just for consideration and not to say this is the answer, but it's sort of including in that vision statement, here's some ways that that could, could actually look like so that people have something that they can <coughs> chew on, respond to, and maybe generate new sort of thoughts on that. I think that will really help those sessions be productive. So uh, I'm hearing, uh consensus, I think, <laughs> among us, at least for initial first steps. Is that enough for you, Dr. Morris, to do you feel like you have clarity on, on uh, what we're coming back with and a general timeline? So I have clarity. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't sound like a good thing. No, no, no. <laughs> clarity is always a good thing. Um, so I'm just going to share dangerous thing, just what I'm thinking. It's not fully formed yet. So. So I fully agree with, you know, the reasons to have a professional facilitator. Like, there's no disagreement there. To have four people in the role of co-facilitator seems like a really bad idea, right? Like, if someone's going to be the facilitator, I feel like they should be the facilitator, especially if they're a professional facilitator. Not that I wouldn't be present or we couldn't figure out some way to have. So, you know, I just I don't want to be halfway about it. You know, I think if, if that's the <coughs> route to go, and I think there's good reasons that are articulated to go that route, I have no issue with it, but I think the idea of having four people who have some quasi-official role to facilitate is just a recipe for um, a session that doesn't go smoothly. Um, so, I mean, my thinking is, you know, if there's a member or two who might want to work with me on that, um, that aspect, finding facilitator, flexibility, right, those things. And I think, you know, I also wonder, just logistically, reasonably, feasibly, um, I think the staff one's probably the easiest one for me to facilitate. Like if there was, if there were decisions that had to be made to, well, the person can do six but not nine or something like that, I feel like that's that's an easier conversation. And stuff staff talk to me about all the time because I'm in the schools and they tell me. So I mean, I think if we'd scale back some of the expectations around the facilitator, it might make it more feasible that someone be actually able to do and fulfill this role. Um, and I could work with them on what staff shared. We could use the same format, but I feel like that's an, <coughs> that's an easier audience for for me to work with, because I just think nine sessions in five or six weeks for someone who doesn't even know we're talking about this right now seems perhaps um, <coughs> challenging um, to do. Um, but I do think, you know, there were so many good ideas today, and some of you have so much expertise in either working with folks or, like, really good ideas about how to, you know, kind of put some bounding on this that I wonder if there's, you know, two members who might be willing to work with me on some of this, um, just because I, I want to make sure we get it right. That's the most important thing, and the more people that we can have outside, you know, bring in yet another school community, which we could certainly do, um, to do that, I think the better off we'll be. So I would be happy to work with you. Um, and I don't know if I'd be happy to have you too. Okay. Okay. Great. Yep. Okay. Um, and I think just to th thinking about the facilitator piece, I mean, you know. Um, 
my concern is also the, the timeline. I mean, budget is a bit of a consideration, but it's also just the timeline of finding somebody. Mm -hmm. And I know that there's, you know, there's, there's a few um, folks who have been kind of in our circles, for lack of a better word, you know, working on other similar projects and things like that. Potentially we could go to them, but, I'm, but I am also, even if we were to find somebody, you know, this week, um, I'm a little worried about, you know, having a outside contractor come in and um, be brought up to speed, put together a plan for, you know, the listening sessions, put together the set of questions. There's a whole big process involved, right? Um, I don't have a lot of faith that, that that could happen, but, you know, I'm willing to be convinced otherwise if, if some people feel strongly that they, they know of, you know, someone or, or a group that could potentially do this kind of work. Um, I'm wondering if the committee members, because I, I agree, I think the facilitators are the best case scenario, having a professional report for all the reasons stated, those are all perfectly good reasons. I'm wondering if the committee would agree if we, if we cannot find a facilitator within this timeline um, to have some other process, perhaps Dr. Morris facilitating and maybe someone else, you know, in, uh, in the, the um, district who's maybe played that kind of role before or, you know, if there's some other way of bringing in a person with relative expertise who's not necessarily is, you know, a professional contractor who does this for a living but maybe who has, you know, this kind of, has done this kind of work. Um, if that doesn't work, then I think the idea of having Dr. Morris and the two co-facilitators from opposite sides of the community could also potentially work. Mr. Nakajima. So I think, I think, <clears throat> I understand the challenges. I think, the, I think the idea you had a moment ago of are there other people within the district or people with expertise <coughs> who, could, who could take on that role? Um, I really like that idea. Um, I'm gonna this. This is gonna sound terrible, but I'm just gonna say it. Um, be careful what you wish for. I I'm not sure I actually do love the idea of have two people from opposing camps from the previous project facilitating a conversation, because I think I know what that looks like under the best circumstances. I also think I know what that looks like under the worst of circumstances. <laughs> And, uh, and I'm not saying that's going to happen, because we'd all hope it wouldn't. And, and I've, I've talked to enough people on both sides of the project to feel like no one would walk into the room ex expecting that. But I'm just like, so like when I imagine some, because we don't know who it would be, mm -hmm. some sort of like faceless unknown person who's simply really good at group facilitation and meeting facilitation, going in there, which you know probably if they work for the district, they'd probably like to see nice new buildings. But other than that, they really don't have probably any particular bias or, you know, dog in the hunt, as they say. Um, that just sounds better. And then echoing, I think, something Mr. Devling said earlier, I think showing respect to people who have been leaders in the community on the subject and having them involved and being explicitly invited into the conversation is a great idea because it's a great thing. And as we were saying at the last meeting, I've been saying at the last meeting, I am excited to see visible leadership from all different sides of past arguments coming forward constructively now, and I'd like to see that happen too. But if for the facilitation of the meeting, I would love it to be somebody who's essentially either professional or neutral. Ms. McDonald. I, I um, solidly endorse that, that perspective too. I actually would be very uncomfortable having individuals that were passionately involved in the prior building discussion facilitating the conversation and it's not for any sort of you know ulterior motives it's just just natural biases and and things and i don't i think this is too important that we really need to make sure that we are having you know at, at best a neutral um sort of less interested less passionate um individual <clears throat> or team of individuals that would be facilitating the meeting. So if we, I'm not quite as pessimistic or skeptical that we'll be able to find somebody outside because I do think it's not just the facilitation, it's the synthesis and sort of here's what we heard and again in a very dispassionate just sort of playing back and synthesizing the themes together um, I think is 
also going to be very important. Also, just for the credibility of that report um, in the end with the broader community. Um, so if that can't, but if that can't be done, I do think that you know whether it's you or somebody in the district who has experience facilitating difficult conversations or you know that you know soliciting feedback in a in a group scenario, I am totally comfortable with that approach because I do think that takes some of the emotion and passion out of it, um, particularly if it's not somebody who works in. Fort River or Wildwood. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Dumbley? You know, I, I know we're kind of um, trying to design this on the fly when none of us are expert facilitators, but, you know, maybe, I, I, I can't remember whether it was Mr. Nakajima or Dr. Morris who said this, that, um, you know, maybe if, there, if there's a representative from the, you know, from the past two advocacy organizations or new sides uh, there, if, if, they're not, if they're not facilitating, if they don't have, like, I'm the facilitator hat on, but they're like, um, you know, I, like, um, invited guests who are sitting at the front of the room who, you know, after Dr. Morris answers a question or after the facilitator answers a question, is there anything else you would like to add? Because I think, you know, part of this is, is, is showing that we really want consensus, <laughs> which is not like we're not looking for um, the thing that is going to dominate the most percentage of, of what we're actually looking to, to, to bring, you know, different groups together. And so, um, I, and so I, th I think a natural concern um, uh, for, for people from different sides is going to be how that information gets presented and if they feel like an answer is getting biased or they would really like to clarify that, to have somebody there who ha you has the opportunity to and that they're, because uh, like so much of this is, isn't just articulating the, the clear information but it's, um, uh, it's, it's how the information is presented and feeling like it's being done in a fair and equi equitable way and so I feel like you know, if Dr. Morris was, was able to reach out to individuals whom he might all already have a individual communication relationship with or, or, or whatever, um, you know, to, to show collaboration, that there, there's support. There's not, you know, it's, it's certainly not, um, it wouldn't be a, um, we'll endorse however this comes out, you know, promise, but we're, we're collaborating. We feel that this is a worthwhile effort. And so at <coughs> least, at least the, the process is being done with sincerity. I think that would be, that would be maybe to address that concern without giving the facilitator head. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I got it. <laughs> um, no, I, 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 yeah, I, I don't think I'll share where I'm good. Yeah, okay. thank you. <laughs> okay, um, so I'm also feeling energy levels starting to, to wane here as well. Um, and I'm conscious of the time. This is supposed to be a much shorter meeting. <laughs> um, so I'm wondering if at least this is enough direction from the committee, if there's any other additional thoughts um, from anyone. I mean, you know, otherwise I think maybe we, we are looking to the next meeting on the 22nd, which is a pretty packed agenda at this point. It is. But um, this is also very urgent. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. <coughs> Well, you're looking for thoughts. I, I, yeah, I, yeah. I, I agree with what you just said. I also think that we've given enough, we, we inside our statements were enough questions of like, hey, Mike, what do you think of this? Hey, Mike, what do you think about that? What's your response to this? Is uh, for that reason, is, and also for the public, because even though it's not being live broadcast, people will get a chance to see this. Um, I would actually almost prefer that after we do whatever this next thing is, we give Dr. Morris a chance to go off and answer a bunch of the questions that we were raising, work with you folks to shape the sessions, and then come back to us with more meat on the bones in terms of what our next steps can be so that we can productively respond. So what I have for the 22nd yeah. is um, the beginning is a planned joint meeting between all three committees that I work <laughs> for because um, there'll be a presentation on the ADA audit um, the meeting will also, just as a reminder, going to be in Town Hall. Um, I think my understanding of Town Hall, and I haven't been in the room since they did it, is that like the technical parts of the presentation will be neat because there's like individual monitors or something like it actually be a good one to test that out in, yeah, from my understanding. I have not been there since it was done, but um, we have a sabbatical request at the Amherst Elementary level that we um, that's the time we have to do it. Uh, we have our initial budget presentation, uh, which is the high-level presentation. 
we'll have this topic clearly. Um, we're going to come back to a registration onboarding process conversation, particularly but not exclusively as it relates to the dual language program about zoning. <coughs> we have budget guidance, which is about food services, library, tech, ELL. Uh, initial, we uh, talked about that. Uh, I have a placeholder for charter school expansion. We talked about that the last time, depending on whether we have information on the 22nd or not. <coughs> a regionalization update, probably a pretty hefty one from mm -hmm. my understanding. Um, Fort, River, Fort River feasibility will be, we actively have more information now than we had last conversation. Um, and then we have to talk about fees and a fee discussion. Um, that says to me there's a lot. <laughs> yeah, sorry. I wasn't saying that like, I don't know, it sounded like I was saying that emphatically. It was just, I was just reading off the page. I apologize. Yeah. You're doing a nice job though. Yeah. Thank we're, you. We're, we're very engaging. <laughs> Well, so then I think the question for the committee is, uh, A, do we want to try to jam this on there as well, or do we want to maybe think about adding an extra an extra meeting date? Um, our very next meeting after that is the 26th of February. Mr. We're going to have to have another meeting in order to get this thing done right. Well, yeah. Just so so that's I what I'm looking thought at. thought I'd right throw a strong calendar. opinion out as opposed Thank to you. a <laughs> weak opinion. I, I don't suspect that you have a strong opinion. <laughs> All right. So that's kind of where we were getting to, which is why I have my calendar open. Um, so looking at the uh, calendar for February, which is already also packed with we've got regional meetings, um, February 5th? Perhaps, Dr. Morris, I'm looking at you. I don't have a Pelham schedule. So in front that's of me. The, uh, Pelham, that's, that's and Pelham we have our meeting. budget hearing meeting. So that's one I need to. You have to I be there. Not sure. Go. You can't just say you're not going. Yeah. No, <laughs> they would be very disappointed. Yes, I would imagine so. Um, well, there's an option of perhaps of doing um, another day that week. Or. When are we looking? Sorry. February fe the February fourth actually, which is that Monday. What about the twenty eighth? Yeah, that's how I come. I feel like it would just be sooner than that. Regions 29th, is that right? Yeah. I mean, other than the unpleasant burden on our schedules, which I'm recognizing is its own thing. So, Chair. Mr. Dunlap. Oh, our next meeting is the 22nd. Uh -huh. Okay. So, if we don't get to any of this on the 22nd, that means the sessions can't really kick off until. Yeah. We talk about them. So when we're picking a meeting date, we're really picking the day before the earliest session date, and really probably a few days before the earliest Potential, session date. Yeah. Yeah. So is there any time between now and the 21st? I mean, there's no reason, I don't think, there's no reason why we can't go ahead and schedule the sessions, right? We don't have to wait for our next meeting, just because we've all agreed right. that we want the sessions. So right. I think yes. the sessions should go ahead and get scheduled. Yes. It's a question of creating the content of the sessions and you know, some of the parameters. Right. Or, or locking it down. Or well, lock, yeah. So uh, I was just looking at the, mm -hmm. the suggestion that the first session would be scheduled the week of January 21st. Right. So really? <laughs> well, starting the week of January yeah, 21st, yeah. yeah. So but those could be the schools, well, I guess that, that would also be the same kind of thing. Um, well, then that, I guess, suppose brings us back next week. <laughs> Dr. Morris. Yeah, th I was going <coughs> to go, Mr. Demling. Um, articulated what I was thinking of as well. Um, you know, that I, I think it needs to be next week. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, hopefully, you know, at that point, um, <coughs> the three of us have met. Does that give you enough time, though, to, to think about what we've discussed? <laughs> Answer our 57 questions. Right. So exactly. No. Which is why I was but, trying to get um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, bluntly, no. But I don't think it's, I, I, you know, not to be flip about it, but I, I think... I would shift the paradigm a bit that the questions were collective questions. Some of them were fortunately for me, but I, I viewed a lot of the questions as being, how do we want to structure this, that there weren't about educational. It's, it's not all about all the specific answers. Right, though. that's right, right, yeah, yeah. Of course not. Yeah, and, and so I know we're using that as a colloquialism, but I just, I don't, I don't see that as a huge lift for me personally coming back with it. I think it's actually a, a collective lift for the three of us to get together at some point this week, do lots of outreach and come back next week with, you know, Here's a, like a more articulated plan of who can lead the sessions, how that's going to go, and then a joint conversation about you know what kind of framing or boundaries do we want on the conversation so we get the information we're looking for. That's how I was viewing it. Maybe yeah. that's self-interested, okay. but that's how I was actually looking at the 16th. 16th could work as well. Wednesday the 16th. I will have a hard time unless it starts later. How late? Actually, I will have a hard time. 
Okay. I think it'd be later than people are comfortable. So 14th? No. <laughs> 14th Monday the 14th, is that what it for? Thursday the 17th. What about Thursday the 17th? Monday the 14th is Valentine's Day, so we could be all happy and loving. January? January 14th? Oh, January. <laughs> Peter, it's, it's sweet you celebrate that every day. <laughs> Seventeenth. Uh, so either of those work. Uh, they work equally fine. For me. I like. Okay, so folks, seventeenth. Does that work? It gives you more time you to work together. Yeah, I think absolutely. it's important that more time to work? work on this. Okay, so let's do seventeenth. So six o'clock on the seventeenth um, is our next meeting date, and then uh, Miss McDonald and I and Dr. Morris will find some time during the next week or so to to get together and work on this. Great. Is that it? I think that's it. All right. No gifts. Mr. Nakajima. Move to adjourn. Do I have a second? Second. All right. All those in favor of adjourning. Aye. Thank you very much. We are adjourned.